Hello there. <laughs> Hello. Um, I wrote an email about space, queer space, and heteronormativity to my beloved partner that I really would like to share with you. Hello there, my sweetest person. Are you having a good day? I'm having a break from thinking. I feel a lot lighter today than I did yesterday when it comes to writing. No blockage at all, and actually, I'm giving less fucks about the expectations I set for myself. It feels so liberating. This is also due to the text I read this morning. It was a chapter called Queer Feelings from the book The Cultural Politics of Emotion, written by Sarah Ahmed, a theorist who writes a lot within the realm of queer, feminist, and race studies. She wrote all kinds of things that I felt so drawn to in this chapter. Anyway, in this chapter, she talks about space containing heteronormativity, explaining that heteronormative space is predefined by the people who live exactly within the norms that fit this normative life. This a life that a majority of people are ensuing and which throughout time defines space and therefore becomes comfortable, uh, becomes a comfortable place for the ones who fit within. In other words, space is filled with heteronormative comforts that already have shaped space. If and when bodies fit in this space, it's comfortable because it fits the expectations of the bodies that enter and feel at, e and ease, it, uh, feel at ease in it, subsequently making it difficult for those who do not fit the norms. For example, people who are marginalized because of their gender, sexuality, race, or social status. Actually, you could see heteronormativity in space as a, count of, uh, as a kind of sticky cloud that oppresses queer bodies, leaving traces on their inner and outer surfaces. Perhaps the sticky cloud could be better compared to treacle, in which movement is difficult. The stickiness makes it impossible to get rid of heteronormativity, for whenever you come in contact with it, it sticks. As a result, this viscous cloud is just fluid enough to move, but uh, too, flutter, too solid to flutter, meaning it's impossible for queer folks to freely move through a space as predominantly filled by heteronormativity. Where the, bodies between their, uh, where, where the boundaries between their bodies and heteronormativity are violated by, by this trackle, deluding the self, dissolving um, in this viscosity of the sticky cloud. The repetition of moments of interpolation harm queer people and causes damaging experiences, implicitly or explicitly insinuating that they failed in their failure to live up the hey you too of heterosexual self-narration. Ultimately, you sink into, into this cloud by adapting to what is perceived as normal, thereby becoming the, your invisible self. This leads to a suffocating feeling in which you dissolve into the masses of heteronormativity. It is within a space like this where queer folks do not fit, want to, or belong to. Spaces where queer people are unable to move through and thus have no choice to produce their own space, claiming their existence to find a way to move within this pressing viscous cloud. Actually, producing space gives a, uh, gives a wonderful opportunity to freshly shape space to your liking. I think you and I recognize this feeling all too well, I just described. I notice that when I enter normative, heteronormative spaces, almost 80% of the spaces that I visit, I am regularly swallowed by old patterns that, though, that even though I'm in the midst of deconstructing them, uh, have thought to maintain in order to merge in that cloud of heteronormativity. Even though I claimed my space years ago by accepting myself and this also demanding acceptance from my environment, I noticed that I will experience a struggle within uh, with how I want to create my space. My brain visualizes these patterns or codes of heteronormative spaces as how I call them, my personal lines of thought that have emerged to comprehend the spoken and unspoken rules of society. Imagining my true self hovering above these lines to navigate me through heteronormative reality, generating an overload of expectations and rules that sometimes smother me. Those lines represent a costume worn to conform the expectations of the norm and where every thought, decision, gesture or manner of speech is judged. It is sort of a present of heteronormativity, especially emphasized after turning down a queer utopian moment or memory by entering the space of heteronormativity again. And by the way, didn't I uh, explain to you that feeling of a certain misplacement the other day? 
something that I have felt difficulties with defining and have been trying to excavate its root. Sarah Ahmed could not put this in better words, and I will quote. Queer subjects, when faced by the comforts of heterosexuality, may feel uncomfortable. The body does not think into a space that has already taken its shape. This comfort is a feeling of disorientation. Once, once body feels out of place, awkward, unsettled. I know that feeling too well. The sense of out of placeness and estrangement involves an acute awareness of the surfaces of one's body, which appears as surface when one cannot inhabit the social skin, which is saved by somebody's and not others. Furthermore, queer subjects may also be asked not to make heterosexuals feel uncomfortable by avoiding the display of signs of queer intimacy, which is self an uncomfortable feeling, a restriction on what one can do with one's body and another's body in social space. Is this familiar to you too? It is very much to me. Moreover, I came to realize that not fitting in or feeling discomfort opens doors to possibilities. Open doors that can be difficult, but simultaneously also very exciting. Another thing that I came to realize is that I'm stuck in de-assimilating myself from the norm. Ach, this chapter made me realize so many things. I almost can't hold myself from copy-pasting all, par all the parts I marked, but I will resist myself from doing so. Oh, and last thing. A few days ago, a thought came to mind. I was asking myself when I'm imagining a space outside, within the gaps, or beyond heteronormativity, does that imply that I approve of the hegemonic systems imposed upon me? I find myself trying to imagine a reality without heteronormative constraints. Is this then implicitly pressuring myself into its norm? Anyway, now I'm eager to ask you some questions. How would you imagine or reimagine your reality? And if you were let go your thoughts, thoughts, how would you create your space? And if you're already doing this, can you send me some magic of yours? I'm very curious. Lots of hugs from me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or you would like to start a conversation, I'm around. Uh, just come to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>
like a normal life for um, good uh, people who are trying to make their livings and their kids living and then they were taken by the surprise out of their normal life you know man erzählt nicht wirklich dann äh, über uns ja, die Leute wissen Syrien und es gibt dort einen Krieg, es gibt viele Leute aus Syrien. Ist ja das auch sehr wichtig, dass die Leute hier wissen. Aber wir auch, also als Palästinenser, als äh, Flüchtlinge. Ich denke so, weil es unsere Identität ist. So viele don't remember your identity, but are you? Yeah. Even though it has like the yeah. both negative side and positive sides. Yes.
。快啲 ，OK， 開始。Garbage。Garbage。Rubbish。Shock。Shock。Shock。Enough。Enough。Three。Three。Three。Three。Three。Three, three, 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 three men, three, three men, three men, three men, three men, three, three. I am in the Prince Street Garden, but you are not here. Sitting on the roses that remind me of the one in my grandparents' house. Grandpa said they will survive for a good, long time. People are such in memory of the loss of love, a family member, a friend, a city we called home. To make private memories visible in the public, welcoming everyone in the city to take a seat there, to have their quick bites, or for the dogs to mark their territory. Private memories built around the city, multiplied, altered, interpreted. A personal story becomes the story of many. Perhaps. It is always about visibility and utterance, about marking of territory. Over 100 years, Hong Kong has imported and exported by sea. Day and night, the five-star ferry comes and goes between Kowloon and Hong Kong, providing cross-harbor transportation for communities tied to the tradition of trade by water. The geography of the Hong Kong colony consists basically of three areas, Hong Kong Island, the Kowloon Peninsula, and the New Territory. The communist border lies only 22 miles to the north. There, a lonely communist soldier stands guard all day. Beyond the green hills lies China. So, your boss, two things will happen. One is to go to the Chinese Foundation. 一系去 British Council 学英文。十六岁嗰年嘅冬天，爹哋妈咪特别忙，佢哋忙住想象我嘅未来。五个月之后，佢哋送咗我去美国。喺飞机起飞之前，佢哋已经帮我谂好六年之后我会翻嚟做咩。如果佢嗰份工，佢哋谂我喺边度读书，报咩科，读咩学校，嫁边个做会未？佢哋话，浸完咸水翻嚟，我应该会唔同咗。不过我冇理佢哋
。但是自从五岁那一年，我吃了一罐过期的凤梨罐头之后呢，我就没有再讲过话。妈、嗯、因为这样子，所以我朋友很少，想找份工作做呢，也就变得很难。所以我最后决定。我要自己做老板。三十岁嗰年嘅夏天，好似特别热咁。我望住个维多利亚港喺度谂。点解冇人喺度游水嘅？你话俾我知嗰阵时嗰啲英国人嚟到，佢哋就一条起嘅街就往后大到，但系嗰啲沙石佢哋冇地方等，所以就倒晒落维多利亚港度。咁即系其实成个国际金融中心都系起喺沙石同埋垃圾上面。佢哋越填越出，地方是越嚟越大。维多利亚港就越嚟越窄，我望住前面嗰堆黑衫嘅人，突然之间我觉得啲阳光好似啊，我啲眼泪不断咁流出嚟，唔知系咪因为天气太潮湿咧？由嗰日开始，我啲眼泪就冇停过。时候啱啱戒嗰阵时啊，即系嗱啲 reproduction 嚟嘅，即系重新再画。哦、oh, ，OK， 呢个系啱啱签做嗰阵时做啊，即系系咪唔知啊，我都要问下。你住喺你住喺呢度，你住喺呢度。西湾，即系呢度。对对，就系。我住喺呢度咯，即系橙色嗰一块。系，我住喺呢度，即系已经填到唔适应啊！吓，填咗出嚟个青衣。同我讲系，喺呢度冇人去。呢度，咦，系咪啊？呢度先，沙田。呢唔系沙田呢度咯？过咗。诶、欸，我睇错咗添，我沙田喺度。但系你填咗海啊？系啊，呢呢一忽啊。夹埋咗系咪？呢度啊，应该因为呢一度嗰条啊，系啊，夹埋咗呢度，系即系我屋企填出嚟，即系我琴日咪话赶晒新界佬走就系，但系好唔同嘅，以前唔系。嗯、不知道从什么时候开始，在每一个东西上面都有一个日子，秋到一月过期。肉酱也会过期，连保鲜纸都会过期。我开始怀疑，在这个世界上还有什么东西是不会过期的？马车，老师没电了，看到了。And territory integrity, taking account of the history of Hong Kong and his realities, taking account of the history of Hong Kong. 好 heavy 啊！真系，其实我依家真系好好在 disappointed， 系，我哋 nominated by， 佢哋话咧，一九年定二零年，咁一八年，第一次修改基本法，欠咩嗰啲释法，嗯，佢哋话中国话中英联合声明已经。完成咗佢嘅任務啦，即
一八年，係唔係咧？咁嘅時候，係啊，就話已經完嘅呢份嘢，真係歷史文獻，真係依一個係歷史文獻。跟住英國就係講話帝遊，即係以後遊嘅啫。呢一啲係佢，因為佢冇帝，中國嘅話。有啊，有講過呢一份，但係你 resume， 因為佢係講啊，佢想鹹濕佢啊嘛，其實佢要點樣處理，字都冇人理。同埋，同埋咧，原來有期限嘅嘢咧，都係一啲真嘅。你有冇射落去啊？嚇，有冇？哎呀，你好得意啊，志志。好似开心啲，系啊，开心猪猪啊，哎呀，好得意，啷啷唔得咯，好开心啊 ！We only found out his kidney was failing on the day I arrived. We took him to Victoria Park before he became too weak to stand on his own feet. Sometimes he gets more strength. With his bright eyes, he turned his head to follow our voices. Sometimes he could barely open his eyes. We know he's listening to us, and we are listening to his short and quick breath. 我哋专登讲多啲佢中意嘅嘢俾佢听。啷啷好叻喎，边只狗狗咁叻噶？我喺度谂，当佢死咗嘅时候，呢啲说话会去咗边咧？嗰日食完饭。我哋两个 X 唔住喊到癫咗，妈妈话佢想翻屋企。我谂，当我哋拣咗要自由，我哋拣咗重新开始。系啊，我哋好似多咗自由咁。但系跟住咧，跟住点啊？原来去到生死个 moment， 我可能唔系我自己想象中咁清高，咁向往自由。每朝起身，我对眼都会好痛，但系记唔记得咗点解？可能系因为天气太干燥啊。但系嗰一痛嘅感觉，时不时都会喺梦入边再出现。我梦见我自己喺被入边喊住咁讲：，我以后都唔会再离开香港Summer this year is like winter. You will properly say it's climate change. There's a star engraved on this bench. It reminds me of the one engraved on the bench of the ferry.
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm going to wait another couple of minutes uh, to see if we have get a couple more pe people to join. Um, could you? Yeah, perfect the, for the setup. Nice. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll be starting in a few minutes, so um, make sure to come around, take a seat, um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. <laughs> So yeah, if you're around, just come over to the stage. Um, we're going to have an interview starting in a few minutes. All right, so then I'm going to start. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm Alex Schwey. I'm um, social designer slash design researcher and I'm the creator of Non Nation um, and I'm going to be presenting this to you um, today at this very special occasion so I'm very glad you could all join um, so first of all I'd like to maybe start with a few questions to the audience so um, how many of you have a passport how many of you have access to healthcare. So these are just two examples of um, human rights that are very important for uh, people to have a fulfilling life. And um, statelessness is an issue that affects 10 million people, maybe more, around the world. So 10 million people do not have citizenship, do not have nationality, and thus are not able to access some of these really basic human rights. And, um, and they're found all over the world, um, and even in your own home country. So Non-Nation is a 3D virtual parliament. It's a meeting space designed for political discussion uh, and debate, but also political representation for those who do not have any. It's a blank canvas, and um, the aim is that together we're building a community that can build on it, we're collecting stories on statelessness, we're collecting information, and we're going to be doing this right here, right now, with your help. And in the future, the goal of, of um, non-nation is to provide a seat within the UN um, for those who do not have one. There's 10 million uh, people who have no citizenship, no seat within the UN, um, so that they can access conversations and debates on uh, nationality rights within the UN, permanent uh, seat. So um, today we have a very special guest joining us. Um, so welcome very much, uh, Mostafa Betare. It's really, uh, really great to have you here. How are you? Hi, hi. <coughs> hear me? Are you hearing me well? Yes, we can hear you. I think you might have to speak up a small bit. Cool, cool, cool. So, um, yeah, Mostafa. Cool. Uh, thank you for having me today. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us. Could you maybe introduce yourself to us? Uh, actually, I'm Mustafa Bitari. I am, uh, let's say, uh, a program coordinator in a Brolic Height organization. I'm one of the former fellow in uh, OHCHR uh, with the United Nations. Uh, I born in the refugee camp in Syria as a statelessness, uh, let's say, there. And uh, I'm here uh, creating a lot of initiatives related on uh, the minorities, statelessness, and a uh, lot of other minorities in the community. Uh, actually, my big title is Artivist. That means I'm artist and activist trying to use the art to raise awareness about the important issues in the community. Uh, I'm working as a trainer facilitator with many other uh, NGOs, so simply like this. 
Thank you very much. That's great. And uh, you're currently based in the Netherlands, is that correct? Yes, I'm in the Netherlands. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about your experience of coming to the Netherlands, being stateless, and, um, and what that's like? Uh, yeah, uh, to be frank, Netherlands, from, uh, if we are comparing the situation between countries, it's uh, from the best countries that treating the statelessness. If we are talking about the papers and uh, because you are grabbing the nationality within three years, but generally the whole minorities in the whole world suffering from a lot of challenges, uh, as simple as like the statelessness. So Netherlands, uh, good, uh, let's say, but the whole refugee camps and the statelessness camps, it's uh, quite, uh, let's say, difficult, and we need to pay more effort to raise the capacity and the quality inside these camps, uh, simply like this. Uh, to be frank, we, we are facing, as always, a lot of challenges, uh, like uh, hate speech, uh, racism, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, isolation and many other issues. But because of that, we are creating kind of these initiatives. Uh, when you are accessing uh, to the Netherlands, you, you have an access to the healthcare, you have your papers, and you can have kind of uh, security, uh, let's say, uh, a system that avoiding the challenges in front of you, but even though uh, as the home minorities in this earth, uh, we are suffering from a lot of challenges and we hope we can develop it within these kind of initiatives and uh, with combining our efforts with the government, the governmental work, let's say. Great, thank you. And um, can you maybe let us know a little bit about the naturalization process in the Netherlands? Um, and um, could, if you could tell us um, how this works for um, Palestinian stateless people or um, other stateless people. Yes, uh, you have two, two, two sessions here. Uh, you are entering the Netherlands as a refugee. If you are statelessness or non-statelessness, you are in, in the refugee process. Mm -hmm. So, but there is a lot of uh, statelessness people cannot access uh, as a refugees. Because of that, they are stopping the pr procedure with them and try to send them back. We don't know where uh, because they don't have uh, any uh, in the system or in the law. They don't have any country to return back to these countries. So they are facing a lot of new challenges, let's say. But let's talk about, for example, the Palestinian Syrian refugee as a statelessness. Uh, because there is a war in Syria, they came to the Netherlands and then they uh, accept them as a refugee ins inside the Netherlands. So they start the procedure with them and uh, just the difference between the normal refugee and the statelessness, that uh, it's a nationality procedure because the statelessness people can take it if they paid the effort in the immigration system and the exams and all of these things, they can have the nationality within three years but the other uh, let's say the other uh, refugees they have to spend five years to grab the nationality but the rest of the procedure is the same as simple as any refugee they have to go to the camps stay there between one year till five till uh, sorry till, till eight years there and then he can grab the permit stay or uh, let's say, the paper to complete his or her life in the community. Yeah, as simple as this, this is the procedure here. But Thank I have to mention, there is a lot of challenges inside mm -hmm. it because it's related on the human employees and some other NGOs inside Netherlands. So you are facing a lot of delay, a lot of uh, discrimination, a lot of racism, and, 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 etc. So we need to develop this system because of that we are creating a lot of initiatives to also bridging between the government and the NGOs to know exactly what's going on and to try to develop the procedure in the, in the ground, let's say, or in the field. Yes, that's very important. So um, could you tell us, because um, you are f um, a former minority fellow of the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
So um, could you tell us uh, a little bit about this and what the UN is doing uh, internationally? What kind of international efforts are being uh, made at the moment? Yes, that's very important. So, um, uh, to be frank, the UN is trying to do a lot of things related on the minorities and uh, let's say the statelessness especially because it's really uh, unfair to be in this uh, earth and there is uh, more than 10 million people they don't have nationality so it's, there is something wrong uh, one of these initiatives it's uh, the fellow or minority fellow program uh, they are creating each year kind of uh, training master program uh, they are accepting people from everywhere to educate them about the mechanism of the United Nations and how they can develop with the United Nations a lot of initiatives related on that. Then you can start to work with, with them. And they are, yeah, they are doing a lot of initiatives, uh, to be frank. Uh, one of them, it's, uh, you can see in the links that I uh, shared it with you, uh, like there is a nomination of comp uh, competition related on the statelessness. They will announce about the winner in the end of uh, this year, I think in the 4th of November. Also, they have a campaign, an online campaign, offline campaign related on uh, the statelessness and the minorities. They have a lot of training and courses. Uh, let's say they are launched online and offline. One of them, I worked with them in the Faith for Right toolkit. Before one month, we finish this toolkit, let's say, and it will be online actually next month. And all the people can follow this course to know more about the mechanism in the United Nations and how they can, uh, or how they they are trying to 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 raise awareness about a lot of issues. One of them, uh, the minority issues in uh, the earth. So simply like this. But there is a lot of initiatives launched by the United Nations, especially the OHCHR uh, office, let's say, or uh, apartment there. So you can follow and you can grab a lot of information about what's going on. Also report, about, uh, you can send your report related on any issue. Uh, yeah, simply like this. Thank you very much. And you've shared some very interesting links with me. We'll be adding them in the space later. Um, but first of all, could you maybe tell us mm. about how can art empower minorities? Because this is also something you're working on, correct? Actually, yes, yes, definitely. The art, it's a, it's a really important tool to use it in this field Very because much. you are bridging, raising awareness and uh, uh, let's say uh, educate the people, uh, let the majority and minority work together uh, advocate by using the art, all of these things you can do it by using the art and you you are giving a space to the minorities and the statelessness uh, to practice their culture inside these art spaces that you are creating and uh, even though the art it's a really nice tool to let the people at least talk with each other you know and break the stereotype that are creating in the mind related on the, all of these issues so uh, mainly we are trying to gather the people to do the art with each other that's mean they can uh, in the future do another thing with each other and you know how much the art is important because also we are sharing the beauties that the people carrying in the shoulder related on all of these things that's very nice to hear um can you also tell us a bit about um what you're currently working on Actually, now I'm working as a program coordinator, as I told you, in the refugee camps here in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm an artistic program coordinator with them. So we are trying to support and empowering the refugees inside the camp uh, by using the art. This is one. I'm uh, doing uh, or I'm launching with the United Nations Faith for Right Toolkit. We are working on this uh, course with many other partners like Oxford, uh, the American University, USIP, and uh, a lot of uh, other, uh, let's say, partners are working with us for this uh, toolkit. We are celebra uh, celebrating the minority declaration this year, and we'll do kind of, uh, let's say, artistic and unartistic uh, initiatives in the United Nations this year. We are empowering the 
the leaders or the community leaders in the community uh, by I'm working with BMW Foundation in Berlin and Place Foundation in Paris to empower the community leaders in the community, especially from the minority groups and uh, let's say from the statelessness groups. Uh, actually, many, many other things, uh, let's say, but this is the main initiatives that I'm uh, working in. That's very good to hear. You sound very busy. So um, I think maybe it's a good time now to add some, uh, some of the links that you shared to our uh, library. So um, my assistant is going to help me um, move over to our living archive, um, our space where we're collecting lots of different documents, lots of different people's contacts. Yes, I would like to... Uh, yes? So um, we'll be back to you in a second, Mustafa. We're just going to uh, add... Um, this is a link uh, to a video that uh, Mustafa is... a uh, speech that he's given at the UN uh, OHCHR. And um, it might take a few moments, sorry. Um, and then we can move back to Mustafa to complete his question. There is a bit of audio feedback. Mustafa is a speech that he's given at the UN OHCHR. And it might take a few moments, sorry. And then we can move back to Mustafa to complete his question. All right, so for those of you just joining right now, we're speaking to Mustafa uh, Betare, who is um, involved in various different organizations working with uh, statelessness, providing um, support for refugees and stateless people who, um, who have no nationality. And um, we're going to teleport back to him right now. Uh, this is our archive where we're collecting information, uh, documents, stories, videos, contacts. Um, and we're just going to go back to Mustafa to, um, for uh, one last question. Um, this might take a little while, but this platform you can also find uh, online under non-nation.com. Non uh, and so Mustafa, sorry, I cut you off earlier. No worries at all. <laughs> Just take your time. So, um, yes, sorry. Um, what was uh, the last thing that we were going to talk about? Actually, just I would like to encourage the people to follow the UN initiatives, especially Faithful Right and the campaign that uh, they are launching now in, uh, in the United Nations. Also, the efforts that they are trying to pay now uh, related on uh, the statelessness and uh, the minorities uh, and the minority right, to be frank, in the community. Uh, also, I would like to encourage the people to participate in the United Nations Forum that will happen in the first and the, in the second and the third of December this year. It will be in the Geneva, so anyone can join us to be part of this initiative. Uh, so also, I would like to encourage the people to follow us and see what we are doing here in the Netherlands related on the uh, community leaders, related on uh, talking with the, let's say, government uh, to encourage and push them to pay more effort related on the refugees and the minority group in the community. Uh, also, uh, Related on the art, we are creating a lot of initiatives uh, here in the Netherlands to bridge between the people through the art. So uh, I'm encouraging the people to use the art always to as a tool and very successful one. Uh, so they can uh, especially work with the children and the women and empowering the women and the children through the art. And uh, yeah, so simply like this, if you have any other question i'm really happy to answer thank you very much mustafa it was a real pleasure talking to you and uh for everyone joining in person and online uh we have um links to uh, mustafa's work in our library and um 
and you can always find us uh, there. And I'm also going to be here at the graduation show um, walking around. Uh, you can come up to me with any questions you might have. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much all we have time for today. But thank you so much, Mustafa. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. And as a statelessness, I born, uh, as I told you, I born in the refugee camps in Syria. So I born as a statelessness. Mm -hmm. I grabbed uh, my nationality before two years and it was a really big and uh, great, uh, let's say, uh, things that happened in my life because living without paper or passport, uh, you don't have an access to the health care, living whole your life inside the refugee camps. It's something really we have to develop it in this community and really thank you for this initiative and keep up the good work because, uh, yeah, it's a great thing that you are doing now, especially in, in, in Eindhoven. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you to Mustafa for having joined you. It is that way. And people will lead you to it. Nicolas' performance will start in two minutes in the theater over here. Thank you.
Make it drop, that's some wet ass pussy. Now get a bucket and a mop, that's some wet ass pussy. I'm talking wop, 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 that's some wet ass pussy. Macaroni in a pot, that's some wet ass pussy. Huh. There's some whores in this house, 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 there's some whores in this house. I'm from Berlin, Germany. I currently live in a tent for four weeks mm. and I couldn't find a long-term place to stay yet. Mm. Home is a certain type of intimacy, uh, not just the place but also the people that you live with. My name is Tony. My name is Greta. Hello, I'm Sam. Lisa. My name is Franz. I'm Daria. And my name is Yvonne. 
So what should I say about the housing problem? That we're basically homeless. I'm Oscar. I'm from Berlin, Germany. I currently live in a tent for four weeks mm -hmm. and I couldn't find a long-term place to stay yet. Mm, home is a certain type of intimacy, uh, not just the place but also the people that you live with. My name is Tony. My name is Greta. Hello, oh, I'm Sam. Lisa. My name is Franz. I'm Daria. My name is Yuval. So what should I say about the housing problem? That we're basically homeless. Uh, also part of the housing crisis. I'm living in Maastricht, which is an hour train away, 20 euros each way. It's really expensive. I live still in Rotterdam and I have to travel every day. It definitely is a struggle. The train stopped running after 12. Uh, it's been really hard finding a place. This is our third time moving. Every time we move to a different Airbnb, and it's super expensive. I wrote messages to maybe like 40 different listings and they all gave me the same answer. I wasn't chosen for a viewing. Uh, everything on Facebook and common and everything, every website I could find and uh, still didn't find anything. How, how am I supposed to find a place if there's like so many other people doing the same? Mm -hmm. It's frustrating. I think a home for me is a place where I can contemplate on the things I went through each day. Right now it's just a rooftop. Like loving people, when loving people surround you. Just a bed, somewhere to sleep, somewhere to shower. But you know, a home is really somewhere where you can come back to and feel safe. I'm from uh, a small town near Eindhoven in the Netherlands. I stayed here for like one year. It's a bit too tiny for me. I feel the most home when I'm away because you've got so much less to do. My name is Ben. I'm half French, half English. Moved from the UK uh, to Eindhoven uh, in mid-August. Yeah, so there's a, there's a shed in uh, in the garden of the house that I've been staying in, uh, but it's been used as a dumping ground for all manner of things. This is a kindergarten northwest of Kiev, Ukraine, which was destroyed at the beginning of the Russian invasion in spring 2022. The space was recorded by Yaro, a Ukrainian photographer, who used an app on his phone to 3D scan the environment. The software developer Polycam has offered its app for free in Ukraine, mainly so that people can digitally capture their national identity in form of cultural objects and places before they get destroyed.
the 3D scanning process converts single images into a visual meta-image. This technique is called photogrammetry and in the context of warfare has already been used 100 years ago, at the beginning of the 20th century. During World War I, the German Wehrmacht was already stitching together aerial photographs of surveillance flights into so-called autophotos to get a spatial overview of enemy positions. During the Second World War, it was mainly the Allies who sent reconnaissance planes over the attack zones directly after the mass bombings of German cities in order to evaluate the damage. Even today, these autophotos help Germany to locate and defuse unexploded bombs from the Second World War that are still in the ground of German cities. Many of the individual images overlap and capture the same section from two different perspectives. With a stereoscope, it is possible to analyze the images in 3D. Modern, computer-based photogrammetry relies on more than two images of the same object to create a three-dimensional model. Especially for larger areas of land and objects, such as buildings, drones are used for this purpose. The mass of drone footage coming out of Ukraine exceeds that from other war zones. The proliferation of commercial drones has led to the increasing use of imagery taken by both professionals and amateurs to show the scale of destruction in areas that have been under attack. By being published on various video and news platforms, the clips spread almost in real time and are thus available to people all over the world, shortly after the footage has been recorded. Visually, the recordings are similar. Slow and constant filming of a building or a landscape from different angles. If a video shows an object from many different angles, a digital model of it can be created with the help of photogrammetry software. Since February, more and more of these models that use public videos as a basis have been uploaded to different 3D platforms. Most of them are destroyed objects, vehicles, buildings or landscapes. Everyone with a computer and free photogrammetry software can participate in rendering available videos into three-dimensional environments, turning digital space-making into a civic-led practice of preservation and creation. Unlike normal photos or videos, spatial records do not tie the viewer's perspective to that of the person who captured a scene with a camera. Instead, they allow for free navigation. This also reduces the disconnection between viewer and object inherent in two-dimensional images. In a journalistic context, that opens up new ways of narrating information. Some news platforms have already experimented with photogrammetry, creating settings that users can actively explore. It is a challenge to guide the reader experience, as the flow of information is not inherently linear. But it's also an opportunity to think about new ways that allow readers to have more influence on how they consume information, and what that might mean for combining it with traditional news forms. With the help of geo-platforms like OpenStreetMap, Google Earth or Bing Maps, the records can be spatially embedded and contextualized. In the process, the direct location of a place or scene is coupled with real coordinates, connecting digital point clouds to the physical world. This allows for a better geographic overview and reduces the obstruction that comes from being removed from the real-world context. In 
this hangar, the largest aircraft in the world, the AN-225, was destroyed by heavy fire. The quality of the model is so good, that viewers can immerse themselves in the site, as if they were there. For people who have been at the place, the model can be a helpful support to go back to the space of the event and recall it in as much detail as possible. It is also possible to analyze whether a statement could have taken place as claimed, for instance whether a person had a clear field of fire at a particular spot. Of course, a 3D model should never be used as the sole evidence to support a statement, and even less so if the author is not a professional, trustworthy source. But in making a scenario tangible, it can be an important building block for a better understanding of past events, especially for people who have not been there. In open source investigation, 3D models have been helping for several years to spatially analyze events and make them comprehensible. Often these models were created from scratch on the computer, using architecture or 3D building software, without incorporating photogrammetry into the process, which makes them less accurate and not suitable for an immersive experience. This makes open source photogrammetric models so exceptional. Almost anyone can participate in capturing a space of an event as a digital replica, enabling a sense of immersion that surpasses other forms of imaging. The immersive quality of spatial photographs can also be beneficial for individuals who have had a traumatic experience in a particular space, allowing them to travel back in time. Under professional guidance, they can address the trauma and reprocess it in a safe setting. Scientists in West Holland are researching on using semi-immersive environments in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, so-called 3MDR therapy. Patients are confronted with events of the past, but retain power over how far they want to approach the trauma through a virtual environment. According to these experts, it would be very helpful if patients had the possibility to take a different perspective in order to perceive what happened from another point of view and to be able to re-evaluate the scenario. The environment can be animated, objects erased or added. Personal photographs, for instance, are valuable in creating a stronger emotional connection to the scenario. Other external stimuli help to focus the patient's attention on something different at the right moment, supporting the process of reflection. For more information, visit spatialarchiveofwarfare.com.
Um, we're specifically talking here about the emotions around the growing housing crisis. And specifically, non-normative ways of living. So I'm talking about squatting, about social housing, about co-living and free spaces, which is a place where Jelisa is going to tell you a story about. Uh, the Almondestraat in Rotterdam was a free space, and it is no longer there. But today we're going to travel to it. So it is based on participatory theater. Now don't get scared. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, shit. <laughs> but I please want to ask you to stand up, come along this side, and follow the storyteller in her story. And uh, engage when asked of you. So come on along, you can come here. Just for your information, we're gonna go around this side. If you're in the projection, don't worry about it. You're part of it, you're part of the streets, you're part of the story. So I want to give the floor to Jelisa and good luck. Enjoy, thank you. When I close my eyes, it's like I'm there again. This crazy, colorful, weird, random and amazing street. With the colorful facades, there's always something happening. I'm standing in front of the communal living room and try to look inside if someone's there. I think they're, I think they're working on building a sauna in the back. If I walk over to the other side of the entrance, here's this space where you could do laundry and there's a big table on Wednesdays, good times, bad times. I have radio there. And once in a while, Yoko organizes play all day with Yoko J. And that's why you see uh, ceramics drying in the window seat a lot. Um, every time he organizes it, everybody gets mad creative. Last time, my son made me an ashtray with the inscription, stop smoking. I think he was trying to give me a hint. And once in a while, you will also see some odd things trying. Um, Chelling likes to make uh, dildos out of ceramics. He's funny like that. Like I said, there's always something happening in the street, and the street is full of adventure. So I would want to invite you guys to go on an adventure with me and do something that we did a lot in the street. I want to invite you to play hide and seek with me. So close your eyes, count to 10, and come and find me. You have to close your eyes and count to 10, though. Otherwise, it won't work. Come on. One, come on, count. Come and find me. Hey there. I'm sitting here with my back against the pink wall that you could carefully made and where she put all of the pictures of everyone from the Om on the street. Organized building by building so you'd know where to find them. It's like a weird collage of strangers that became family. And if I look across this room, I see the window and a bench full of random stuff 
that people left there to share. So that's what we do in the Omo Mystery. We share everything. <laughs> Work, fun, food. That's what we do. There is also a ping pong table, just like the one across the street, next to the social housing company, where we played a lot. Ping pong around the table, or hide and seek, like we just did. I hid a lot under this table. You would never know what to expect in the Omo Street, whether it's a neighbor coming out of his apartment. That randomly starts juggling with fire, or making a garden in the middle of the night, or dancing in the rain. Everything was possible in the Omo Street, and anything goes. All of a sudden, I hear a sound from the living room. So I go inside and see Nelly and Blaze. One of my sons playing ping pong. I also want to join, but there aren't enough bats. So what to do? Nelly walks into the back and comes back and said, "I have an idea. I can play with a frying pan." So I laughed, but he actually kicked our asses, and every time. The ball would hit the frying pan. You would hear, "Book, book, 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 book." You could hear it all through the street. It was intense. Too intense. All of a sudden, I'm standing in front of Keju. My home away from home. The place where you could always find me, and I can just see Lacha sitting on the massage chair in the middle of the sidewalk, <laughs> enjoying the sun. Don't ask me why there was a ma massage chair in the middle of the street. <laughs> and Brian and Yuana are singing stickers on the on the window, and Flip and Laurens. Are folding out a huge tent because Flip was going on a camping trip and she wanted to know how it folded out. My dad came over to read the newspaper and next to him was Algernon smoking a joint. This bizarre picture, and it all kind of made sense. I step inside and see. Roland and Bentley playing warm up like we always do. It's getting late. We should head out, but we're not quite ready yet. So I turn around like I do most nights and ask, "Anyone up for a one last chai?" And all I hear is chai, chai, chai. So I walk behind my counter, grab some milk from the fridge, and start frothing it. I add my spices and make my usual concoction. I can almost smell the spices, the cinnamon, and the warmth. So we just hang around for a while and chill while we enjoy our chai. But now we really need to go home. So I grab my stuff, ask if everybody has everything. Are you ready? Let's go. We walk towards the playground in front of the kiosk. And the reception, Flip turns around, and asks Nova, my daughter, "Do you think the magic swing come out would come out tonight?" 
We all yell, "Yes, yes, maybe it will." She runs up, and we look up. She throws out this light, and we put Nova on, onto the magic swing. It's been a crazy day. The light flickers on our faces, and everybody still sounds so excited. We, the magic swing. It's a magical night, like most of the Mara in Normal Mill Street. A crazy, amazing, ma magical night. It's like a dream. A dream that actually happened. And then I wake up. Good morning. Thank you for listening. So, in the Dutch Design Week, we have three storytellers, which is her husband, Julie's husband, and her son coming here. So, if you're here any other day, come also listen to those stories. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to hear if you have experienced something like this, or if you want to talk about it, or just in general, like, oh, I'm just curious, because this was Act One. We have three scenes of Act One, and we're making Act Two and Act Three. So we're still developing and continuing. So any feedback or anything you have experienced is already amazing to talk about. So thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of the day. We're going to build on really quick and put everything outside. And then I'm ready to talk if anyone wants to uh, start a conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a wolf living alone in a cave in the Black Forest. He was born a bit differently from the other wolves of his pack, so they mocked him every time they were frolicking in the clearing of the woods. <laughs> Look at Looney! See how his underdeveloped chin makes his jaw weak and his bite crooked. He'll never be a strong wolf, he'll only be a burden to us not being able to hunt like we do. How could any she-wolf ever want to be with him? <laughs> the old wolf felt sad and lonely. He started to believe in his heart what his brothers had told him. On a cold winter's day, he decided to leave his pack to live in a place where they could no longer hurt him. For years, the wolf lived in that cave. Until one day, he spotted a human girl walking near the entrance of his hollow. He hid away in the dark, not wanting to be seen. The girl started picking the flowers in front of his cave. The flowers that he had tended to all these years he had lived there all alone. At first the wolf went mad, but then he saw how the girl sniffed at the flowers and gave a smile unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Feeling his fear slipping away, he quietly emerged from his black hole. Uh, do you like them? The wolf asked. The girl looked shocked and scared for a moment, but then answered, Oh, yes, and they smell even better than they look. <gasps> oh no, are they your flowers? Yes. I've taken care of them, but you can keep them. You can even come back next spring if you want more. The girl smiled politely, but also a bit wary, and said, uh, That's very kind of you, 
We'll see if I remember how to find this place by then. Goodbye! The girl left swiftly with an uttermost hurry in her step. The wolf felt disappointed. It had been so long since he'd felt the joy of company. And she had been so beautiful too. Seeing her loving his flowers had given him some hope that for the first time someone might actually start to love him. Feeling this new kind of excitement in his chest, he decided he'd follow her, her scent leaving a trail of where he should go. He followed this path, turning the corner, then the next, until her scent entered a little cabin under some maple trees. He ducked next to an open window and heard a raspy old voice. What beautiful flowers! Where did you find them? You could not have possibly found such delicate flowers in these woods. No, Grandma. I've grown them in my own garden for you. I've looked after them for months. They are beautiful, aren't they? Oh, yes, they are. Especially the red ones. I love dearly. <gasps> oh, that reminds me. I had knitted a red little cap for you as a present. Now I will always remember your beautiful red flowers whenever I see you wearing that cap. Big fat tears had started to roll over the wolf's furry cheeks. With shoulders drooped down, he walked back to his cave. He hated her. He had been kind to her, giving her his flowers, which had worked so hard for to become that beautiful. She was evil. She simply did not see how good he was. She probably saw my weak jaw and my crooked bite. That's why she looked so shocked when she saw me. That's why she hurried away. If I had been a strong wolf, she would have stayed with me. Together we would have enjoyed our flower meadow. She is disgusting. Probably learned that behavior from that grandma. I reckon all the women in that village of hers are like her. And why wouldn't they be? My brothers already said I'd never find a mate. Everyone is against me. And why? I'm a kind wolf. I'm just not that pretty. It's so unfair. If I can't be happy, then they also shouldn't be. The next day, the wolf awaited the girl on the path towards grandma's cabin. He saw her red cap emerging from behind the horizon. His heart started beating faster. What the ending is, is up to you, dear listener. What would the wolf do? Like in the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, is he a cold-blooded killer? Would he eat grandma and take advantage of Little Red Riding Hood? Or would he start a conversation with her and discover her perspective of the story? What other possible outcomes can you come up with? And what would you do if you were the wolf? This story is part of my graduation project, Who Are the Villains? A two-faced fairy tale book, but on the one side, a reinterpretation of Little Red Riding Hood for the eyes of an incel and on the other side, a reinterpretation through the eyes of feminism. INCEL stands for Involuntary Celibate, and they are an online community of mostly heterosexual men who have communally created an identity around their lack of sexual and intimate relationships. And as with most online communities, they've created their own very specific uh, lexicon and also their own very specific ideas of how the world works. Um, so they blame, uh, what makes this new development uh, so scary is that they blame women and feminism for their own uh, unhappiness. Uh, so bad even that there have been terroristic attacks uh, in the UK, uh, the US and Canada over the last 10 years, specifically proclaimed in the name of incels. Um, so as with most polarization, the increase of fear uh, for the other side of the spectrum condones violence. So we need to get rid of this fear and we need to get rid of this faceless enemy uh, who is at the opposite side of the spectrum. 
as traditional fairy tales show us, uh, any character can do good or bad at any point of the story. It doesn't matter if it's the hero or the villain. So there's a lot of nuance and there's a backstory. And there's also a complex psychology for a person's motivation. So this book tries to provide the reader with uh, more understanding of the human being behind the ideology through the power of the fairy tale. And then I want to ask you one final time, who are the villains? Are there any? Thank you for listening. I'll be back when I take off my mic and then uh, if anyone is curious, you can also sit in the chair to read the book. And I'll be back uh, for questions. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. We're now live from the theater space. I am Leah, working for the stage, performing, and also here I have Yona with me. How are you, darling? Um, it's uh, exciting, I guess. The fourth day, the fifth day, got lost. It's a lot of work, no? It's something to put yourself on the stage each time, yeah. And can you tell us what you're showing? So I'm having a performance uh, of 14 minutes, which is starting in a couple of minutes, on political identity questions, national identity questions, and uh, the complexities of Eastern Europe and the traditions, uh, how they're recreated every day and not somehow very authentic, but uh, everyday creation by us. And could you tell us a bit more about your research process? Because I think for master students, it's something that's very important, but sometimes it's a bit invisibilized with the project that we're actually showing at the end. So could you tell us a bit more intel about this? The research process. Um, yeah, it was uh, difficult, I would say. Um, um, I had to come through the process what exactly I want to, to investigate. There were some hunches, some interests like... Uh, and uh, Slavic minorities in Lithuania and its contact with Lithuanians. I think my research started as a uh, self-critical record on who I am, uh, what does it mean to belong or not to belong, and uh, it was not, uh, it turned very much uh, in February when the war in Ukraine started and it shifted my perspective on uh, how privileged it is to investigate national identity questions and political questions. Um, and how safe you have to be to, to use your imagination. And speaking of imagination, I think uh, something about your performance and also your work is quite uh, genius in a way that you're using the Lithuanian salad in order to kind of portray this. And I wish you would tell us a bit more maybe about the salad before your um, actual performance. So Lithuanian salad, they're actually uh, very popular in Eastern Europe. And yes, we call it Lithuanian salad, but also uh, homemade salad. In the West is known as uh, Russian or olivier, but it was actually created by a chef of French and Belgian descent uh, who was living in Moscow. And um, the salad mutated through time because he took recipe to his grave and was recreated by other people uh, just from notes and hearsays and things like this. But now they are traditional in Eastern Europe. They are on every feast table um, and people regard it as uh, as a part of who uh, they are, though it's, uh, it's bits and pieces of, um, like all ingredients are coming not from Eastern Europe. They come from South America, from Asia, uh, but still it is something that we hold as traditional. So... Yes, this is a um, salad of Latvians, of Estonians, of Polish, of, of Russians, and of many more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yone. I'm really, uh, I love this project. I'm also very happy to invite people. We're in the theater space at the end. Uh, I don't know if from which screen you're watching this, but basically at the end of this beautiful space, there's a theater one, and we'll be waiting for you for a minute. You can come and sit down here with us, and then we'll start with your performance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I'm the
Pero en Bolivia. Iran en Afganistán. India. Greece, Syria, Turkey, Israel, and Jordan. There is no canteen, no supermarket, and no festive table in Lithuania without Lithuanian salad. Also, sometimes they're called white salad or homey salad. Also traditional salad. White homemade traditional Lithuanian salad. So I change the code Lithuanian in the title of a salad and replace it with the names of the other neighboring nations. I Google. Obvious similarity. France. Romania. India. Indonesia. Lucien Olivier is a chef of French and Belgian descent, but so it happens, is born in Moscow, the Russian Empire. Being a co-owner of a famous Hermitage restaurant, he creates a salad. He keeps the recipe secret. When he dies, only an approximate recipe is being restored. And it crumbles and dispers into multiple interpretations, including ingredients the chef himself does not use. Numerous mouths, notes, and letters, just like this. So my grandmother become the real author. You know that what you eat you are, but what is sweet now turns so sour. In the West, the salad is called Olivier or Russian, but many of us don't call it that way. We say Balta. Kartelisalat. Rossos. Sawatka Jerzynowa.
Sun. The 23rd of August 1991, Friday, Vilnius. The grey rotates in the air, it hooks a tight fitting rope around the monument, the sculpture breaks. The hook body oscillates, leaving two legs on the pedestal. The right thumb gets lost. I'm obsessed with this figure. I'm watching and watching and watching. And he's chewing and chewing and chewing. You're expressing yourself. Briefly, impatiently, hungrily, greedily, rebelliously, earnestly, proudly, arrogantly, ironically. I'm looking at him endlessly so that eventually he does not look real anymore. But actually, maybe I can find him. And I do, and we speak. Sveiki. Ačiū, kad radot laiko pokalbį. Kaip ir aš jau su važinutė, iš tiesų, norėčiau tiesiog trumpai pokalbėti apie tai, kas vyksta 91 metų rūkiučio 23 dieną Vilniuje. Prisipažinsiu, kad jūsų figūra tame video man ikoniška. Atrodo, kad viename taškia viskas susijungia, dvi ideologijos. Viena akivaizdžiai krenta prieš jūsų akius, komunistinė, kita tarsi nepastebimai, einantį per jūsų kūną, kapitalistinė. Tas paminklas, nu ir ne tik jis, bet ir dar ten buvo kažkokių tai biustų ant to žalio tiltų, žinai, jos tapusios buvo miesto šiaip dalimi, žinai, tokia neatskiriama, tarsi ten jis visada buvo ir aš ko anksčiau galvojau, kad visada ir bus samžinybė, visada ten tas Lenas ten toj lūkiškai Lenoj aikštėjai, žinai, buvusiai. Ta minėta buvo toks vienas Vienas šoks bendras darinys, bet jau baimės visiškai nebuvo jokio jausmo ten, kad kai jį nuiminėjo tą Leninę, žinai, jau buvo aišku, kad jau jis nesugrįžti ir atėjo visą gerą į. O iš kur ta kramto maguma, juk tais laikais tai buvo gan deficitas ir, na, vakarietiško ir amerikietiško gyvenimo būdo simbolis, retas dalykatesis. Tiesa, iki 10-ųjų Sovietų Sąjungoje taip ir nebuvo pradėta gaminti, bet net ir tada, kai buvo vekarėtiškai neprilygo. Buvo per švelni, per silpną pusti burbulus ir greitai prarasdavo savo skonę. Ta kramto maguma, tai šiaip sekėsi tiems, kurie turėjo giminaičių užsienį. Mano mama labai daug brolių ir sesirų ir viena iš jų gyveno Vokietijoje, močiutėje mano važiuoja labai. Aš davau lagaminais į Lietuvą ir po to giminėm dalindavo tas lauktuvės. Tai gumos kramtumas sėdint aplink stalą, tam po tokiu savotišku ritualu. Gerandi bendrą ryšį su kitais, dalinėsi bendrą patirtimi ir ta patirtis tampa dalis to, kas tu esi, ar ne? Man patinka galvoti John Didion žaudžiais, jis yra pasakius kažką panašaus į autentiškai nesąmoningą susirašinėjimų grandinę. Tai išpakuoja ten tas lauktuvės, ten visi susirenka giminės, ten kas svarbu, jūs teliam. Kiekviena yra atskiriam po periukė, atskiroj toj folioj tokio, žinai, tas pasitekinimas, kai išvinioji, praplėšė, da kiekvieną ištraukį, žinai, tai dar kamtai ne viso atsilaujo, nuplėšė pusę, žinai, kad pasiliktų mėliau, kad ilgiau pakaktų, žinai, nes atsargus tai baigėsi. Bet tu ne kamtai kramtų. In Lukishka Square, where Lenin's lamp is lost after the demolition of the monument, before Lenin there is Pilsudski, and before him there is a stone, and before a stone there is a marketplace, and before the market there is a 
place for executions, and before that, a place for military exercises, and then there is a meadow, and now... I'd like to tell a story about a girl who decides to find a new name for her father. She lives in Vilnius under the rule of a Soviet regime. Now his name is a derivation from the Latin, Constantinus, to the memory of a great Roman emperor Constantine, Constantine the Great. It means firm and constant. But she decides to change the name and starts to call him Castitus. <clears throat> and by the way, Castitus turns out to be a short form for the name Castutus. In Lithuanian, Kas is what? Tota nation. Kastutas. Kas. What? Tota. Nation. Kastutas. But well, she chooses the name Kastitas. Castitas, the most handsome fisherman in the Baltic Sea. He falls in love with Eurata, the goddess, the mermaid living under the Baltic Sea in her amber castle. And they fall in love. God finds out that the goddess feels affection for a mortal man, he strikes the amber castle and it explodes into millions of pieces. It is said that when amber comes ashore after a storm in the Baltic Sea, it's the tears of your eye, one of which my mother finds in her room in the search for a new name to belong. Eurate and Castitas is one of the most popular Lithuanian tale and legend. The authenticity of the entire story is questionable.
The shared experience of working in a country where you don't speak the language. I could have asked her to show me the movements, but I was shy. Anna Maria, a retired pair of sewing hands, Bussolengo. We look at old payslips. It says 19 liras. She talks about the one time she could see through her finger. She started at 13. She puts your hands straight into the machine, next to an anciana, an elder. And you imitate her movements. You imitate her movements. You imitate her movements. These days, she had to make little holes in little strips of leather, three at a time. So here she goes, chak, 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 chomp. The finger is attached to the machine. Three little metal teeth planted in her skin. Never on sick leave again. Except for the three times 16 weeks she took to give birth to her three children. The radio is saying unemployment, precarity, exploitation, how romantic. The radio is saying salarization and flexibilization here and everywhere else. Decline of material, hegemony of immaterial, knowledge, information, communication, affection and emotion. You are waged and poor. She thought it would be a guarantee to a decent standard of living. Riviera del Brenta, Thermo Shoes, between Padova and Venice. The region is known as highly qualified in the development and the production of luxury footwear, but here in this factory they inject plastic clogs. Do you know what is the common point between a nurse, a, co a cooking lady and a cook? No, <laughs> a cleaning lady and a cook. They wear the same shoes. The founders talk me through the history, the marketing, the design, the production, but don't mention the workers. Then I see a couple of books on the top shelf. Turn some pages and I see 130,000 footwear manufacturers go on strike. You must be a good and capable worker. As an artist, I am risking economic failure, ready to do anything to avoid falling into the category of economic abnormal. So I climb higher. Bosco, Provincia di Verona, 1,106 meters above sea level, pre-Alps of Veneto, and I find them, Gabriele, Ginevra, and Franca. From one sewing machine to the other, zigzag, twin needle, flatbed, unison feet. The basement of this alpine farmstead, una malga. Two hidden body of production, one on top of the other. The social factory on top of the shoe factory on top of the mountain. On her stool, what's left of a pair of boxer shorts, it says Womo, Womo, Womo. Like a woman seated on the butt of a man, and without turning her head from her piece, she says, I can't sew with my two feet. But she can. How essential does this look? A shoe in Italy cost 47, in Portugal 27, 29. In China and in India, four. Female workers became a problem when they started opposing the top and the bottom of the house. I ask, who are they? Those are the ones to go on the moon. Somebody in some Italian mountains in sewing together the shoe of an American lady practicing zero gravity in a giant tin can. But we met this one. They don't look like we can go really far with it. We went to the depot in Elder. Dozens of shelves full of proto shoes, never meant to walk or just not anymore. Transformed into artifacts, stored in the dark. Do you see his enormous invisible hands employed to labor for an artist? Art is economically exceptional. They eradicated the artist's hand. They favored the idea. On one side, the one making, and on the other, the one thinking. Do you know the name of this boring machine? Carving the inside of a tree out, stuffing your foot in and hoping for the best. I met Luther. We went to his house. 
He was painting the top of his, of his clocks with his colors, an emblem, a signature. Here we want contexts, we want concepts, we want processes. The visibility of a work is the unit of measure of its perceived value. He fabricated his own tool, the width of his thumb is the unit of measure. The inspired artist entrepreneur and the ability to subcontract. The working class did not survive, hence the shelf of carved feet. This class excluded independent, unemployed and housewives. Where is the line between the working territory and the outside? We are productive even when we sleep. Let's say we aren't workers. Do not become a woman at work. Liberation and propaganda, a constant dream. You know, four years is not that long. And if there's a government for four years and then there's a new government after that, it's, um, it's going to be difficult to make sure that we will have long-term investments, I, I think. Our Spirit Chances project will never happen. Environmental standards change, political environment change, so that's one factor that can come into play. Influence over Greenland's mining industry is being sought after by agencies from respective international governments. The US has already established a cooperative consultancy in Nuuk that is pumping capital into the mining sector in Greenland and nurturing the political relation with the aim to establish new supply lines for resources. Meanwhile, China, a near-Arctic state and permanent observer, is positioning itself as a vital player in Greenland's emerging industries through scientific collaborations, shipping routes, and to this day holding monopoly on rare earth elements. Greenland's strategic position within the NATO alliance borders Russian territory. With the military escalation, it stresses the need to establish other resource providers and require alternative energy sources. I foresee ramifications on a geopolitical scale when Greenland's underground is going to be mined. So, is there a race? Uh, you have to look at what is potentially coming. Maybe. But as you said, and as you know, it's happening in the exploration. Because you have to acquire the licenses. I hope Greenland, maybe through, through your work, could help maybe to wake up to those people and say, oh, maybe we, we could have a very important uh, room to take in the international uh, history of mining. It is said that every 1,000 explorations, one ends up as a mine. With Greenland's almost 100 current listed explorations, the promises for business postulates greater uncertainties. I tried the drone and it's just way too cold up here. Even just taking my gloves off is unbearable. When does the race start and when does it end? Awaiting the ice to melt, political climate to be stabilized, and business deals to be put into practice. <laughs> Oh. 
we most likely haven't seen the full <coughs> potential of Greenland yet. When will that happen? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I mean, if, if ever.
Arena. Hi, hello. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. How's everybody doing? Uh, this is uh, Stories of Dust, as you can see on the screens. And today you are joined uh, to digest your lunches with uh, three fabulous uh, panelists who are recent grads from this 2022 generation. Here with us we have uh, Gaia Darrigo. Uh, who is an MA graduate from the Social Design Department. Hello. We, we're, also joined by, uh, we're also joined by Dana, Dana Savage, from the BA Wellbeing Department. And lastly, but definitely not um, listly, we're also joined by uh, Gerardo, also known as Jerry Sandoval Osio, from the MA Geodesign Department. Thank you. And I am Miguel Parra, and together, the four of us, we will be navigating uh, the three, three beautiful stories that talk about the layers of dust that, that have settled in uh, our anthropocized planet. I'm also inviting, because I know we have some uh, other dust experts in the audience. I'm looking at some of you here. So whenever we are like in uh, discussion parts of the, of the panel, feel free to raise your hands in case you really want to uh, join in. Uh, so you're welcome to do so. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna invite all of you to look down and around and maybe even uh, dare to like caress the floor, apply some gentle pressure. Yeah, 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 don't be shy, you can do that. Maybe <laughs> then I invite you to uh, take your hands up and look at your fingers and, you know, uh, Rejoice in this beautiful dirt that is all over the, the grad show. Not only the grad show, but generally all over our lives. <laughs> and um, I'm going to maybe pose the question, uh, where, where do we think this dust is coming from? What are the ingredients of this dirt? Is it like maybe some earth from the TU garden next door? <laughs> or maybe some industrial waste, like some plaster or some other construction materials from the fancy high-rise towers that they're building in Eindhoven, in which we will never get to live, probably? Or is it maybe some um, bodily byproducts, maybe some dead skin from some overworked grad graduates? <laughs> or may it be partially some pollution, some like uh, pollution coming out of the fancy, also fancy SUVs patrolling the city? Uh, so this is something that we're going to try to navigate today, like together, kind of like uh, through some stories. Um, so yeah, this said, we're going to go to our first story, which is called View of a Landscape, and it's a story by Dana. I was silent, hidden, completely dark for millions of years. You came to take some of me, just a few blocks. One, two, three, four, five. Layer after layer you unveiled me. I became smaller and smaller. In a blink of an eye, I wasn't the same anymore. Now I am with you all the time. I am within the buildings you inhabit. Without me, your human-built world wouldn't look the same, neither would I. Sorry, I got distracted by you. Let's get back to me again. I used to have my head in the sky, tall as I was. Today I am defined by depth instead. You stopped taking from me. Did I give you enough of me? Are the walls of your houses thick enough? And are your dams high enough to protect you from the floods? <sighs> I thought you would leave me alone now. Leaving me to hide like I did a long time before you came. 
Maybe if you would leave, I could become myself again. Well, let's be realistic. I will never become the old me. Slowly I would fill with water, so I no longer would feel hollow. Bit by bit, roots would inhabit my walls, so plants could grow densely. Eventually, I would be covered by the shadows of an old forest. In the very far future, would you come and visit me? I bet you won't recognize me any more. I would be there, but won't be visible for you. Back to the here and now. You didn't leave me after all. In fact, you still control every inch of my me. You decide for my waters. My inhabitants live according to the labels you give them. Some you call dominant, intruding, or even invasive. But let's be honest. Look at yourself. Aren't you the most dominant species of all? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dana, for that story. Thank you. Would yes. you maybe like to tell us a bit more about the backstory of your story? Like, how did you come to this uh, yeah. tale? Yeah, so the voice you just heard was the uh, the voice of the landscape I researched during my graduation, which was an old limestone quarry in, uh, in Maastricht. Uh, and this quarry has been used to extract limestone for the mm. production of cement. Uh, so right now the landscape is everywhere around us. It might even be in the building we are today. Um, and the bigger questions in my graduation that I, that I uh, was thinking about was also uh, if we extract such huge amounts from the earth, what do we actually do with a landscape that is left behind, with the scar that is left behind? Uh, what do we do with the new nature that takes it slowly over? Do we maintain it or do we uh, maybe decide not to be part of it at all? Yeah. That's, uh, Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on, because you, you were yeah. saying you kind of uh, give a voice to the, to the, to the quarry itself, yeah. so kind of maybe on what do you think are some consequences or even um, reasons for uh, this nature-society divide that maybe kind of you're mm -hmm. trying to bridge with your project? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, you often see that when we talk about real nature, we kind of define it through our own absence of it. So we see it as something that often we define it by something that we are not part of somehow. And um, I think it's sometimes also dangerous to, to see it as such separate things because um, uh, when we exclude ourselves from the idea of what nature should be, um, we actually forget that we are actually part of it. And, um, uh, um, but as soon, I think, as we get rid of this separation and of this in-between gap, I think we come to a better understanding of that uh, we are part of it and when we, that, that our actions are part of it and that we, if we destroy it or if we damage nature, that we, at the end of the day, damage ourselves as well. So uh, by giving the landscape a voice, I try to put the human a little bit more within the nature and try to challenge this perspective. Yeah. I think it's also particularly interesting from a Dutch context in which these uh, lines of like the, what is society and what is nature and what is man-made and what is actual uh, wilderness is quite a yeah. dark gray area to like define because basically there's almost no wilderness maybe to um, jump into a more uh, like heavily built environment like a city, let's say. Maybe you, Gaia, could comment a bit more on, like, elaborate on Dana's answer and what, what may be some consequences of this uh, uh, divide, uh, so society, nature, but also, like, uh, dust as earth and pollution as an antagonistic entity of, uh, of humans living in a city. Yes, I definitely agree with Dana. And, uh, well, I have to be honest, like, I grew up in a human-made environment, mm -hmm. So, in this sense, 
I always connect uh, what is the activity happening in the city with, uh, with how it affects reality physically, including the cultural production of it. Mm-hmm. So, and in this sense, the result uh, is that the body of the city is kind of inseparable from the body of pollution and our body because the way it settled, this dust settled on the facade of the buildings, then it also settled in our organism mm-hmm. and, uh, and we created. And uh, it's, it's more like a mutual relation rather than uh, uh, just divided this boundary. So this, uh, this is something that we, you were kind of like already putting on the table, this idea of this hybridized um, relationship to uh, pollution and uh, like w- what is actually antagonistic or what is, who is a cr- uh, producer and who's like a consequence of that. Maybe like going back a little bit, maybe I can segue into Jerry's project and maybe you can comment rather about the, not the consequences, but the, maybe the reasons, the interests that may lie behind uh, this, this divide this, that, that we're seeing, because uh, I know that your project kind of focuses in a really concrete uh, social political case study, so maybe it's something you can comment on. Yeah, for sure. Like, my project is uh, based in Mexico, in an industrial city called Monterrey. Mm-hmm. So this city is um, actually grew from the industry, you know? Um, but I, I see this process that comes also like from way uh, before that. No? There's a, a history in, in the Americas about colonization. So like 426 years ago, there was like the first settlement in this city, mm-hmm. uh, which it was uh, these Western views about the, the, the environment, the landscape was brought. No? Like everything was uh, in the search of silver in, in, that, in that time, like the, um, the, the Spanish Empire. Mm-hmm. And like all this landscape was a, a site for resource uh, extraction since the beginning, no? Um, but then in this uh, moment of modernization of, of, of uh, the Americas, which is like in the early 1900s, um, now the industry, the newborn industries were uh, started to settle. And one interesting thing is that in Monterrey, it was the first uh, big steel company, big steel factory in all America. And from there, it started like all this discourse about this industrial city. Um, So everything was uh, in a way, or the city was born with this idea of resource extraction, of um, the accumulation of capital. Um, And in the end, all these uh, people that are in in power, um, deciding what's uh, going on in the city, they just kept uh, this kind of narrative without actually um, talking about what are the consequences of extracting and um, also uh, separate ourselves from the actual uh, ge- geographical uh, environment. No? And now after these uh, kind of 100 years, uh, uh, the consequences came up no? and this, uh, this uh, social environmental backlash and um, yeah, so all these uh, consequences are actually with a political and economical reason behind it. And all these narratives are built around this idea. Uh, but yeah, now we're seeing the consequences and that's what, uh, where we are uh, kind of uh, looking into, no? Mm-hmm. So in a way, it's like an inherited uh, problem from like, a, like the whole city was uh, conceived already with this uh, issue at the core of it. Exactly. And all this past view were in a way like the views of the uh, indigenous people were erased. Mm-hmm. So every connection that we had uh, in a way to the environment or to the mountains or to the geographical um, territory has been erased and changed to this uh, more um, yeah, Western view. No? I, th- I think this is also something w- you can uh, like maybe tell us a bit more about maybe like present uh, actions that are like happening in Monterrey to like maybe subvert this structure like the in which the, the city has been laid out. So maybe I would suggest we go on to our second story, which is called Sensing the Mountain City by Jerry.
la última fundación de la ciudad como ciudad moderna, pues le dan la espalda totalmente al tema ambiental. O sea, no, no existe Monterrey en relación a su naturaleza en lo absoluto. ¿no? Pues es una ciudad eh, industrial, 100%, que crece a partir del empleo que estas empresas este, generan y que crece a partir del espacio que estas empresas generan y por lo tanto las relaciones que se desenvuelven están íntimamente relacionadas con esta idea utilitarista de la naturaleza. ¿no? Es menos del 2% de la población que controla el 90% o arriba del 90% de la riqueza de la producción de aquí. Me parece que ven este territorio, incluidas las montañas, como, como una fuente de negocio. Hablaría como de un componente de infraestructura, que es como que siento que es el que más negocios da a esta clase política, ¿no? Pues todo lo que se genera de la ciudad se queda atrapado en, en este valle y solo tiene una salida, ¿no? No es como una planicie donde se dispersen así como así. Tú sales estando en el valle, o sea, en la ciudad, y cuando no ves las montañas dices, está contaminado. Entonces hasta indicador ya se volvió la montaña. Entonces, pues esta ambición yo creo que ha sido mucho lo que ha hecho que como ciudad lleguemos a tal descontrol de estar contaminando y estar atentando contra la salud humana y crecer en cifras de ansiedad y crecer en, cif de, en cifras de depresión y suicidios y demás. Pues ver el tema de las montañas, su importancia para absorción de carbono, atrapar polvos, y la montaña sigue siendo natural y sigue teniendo una capacidad de carga de, de gases y de partículas y de extracción y, y de todo, ¿no? Pero también es un, pues es que no es suficiente y la montaña no puede sola. Tienes que, como ciudad, eh, pensar de forma sostenible y cuidar lo que tienes, ¿no? A la ciudad le hace falta un sistema metropolitano de descanso, de contemplación y de relación con la naturaleza. Y yo creo que esto es lo que sigue. Ya estamos tocando, o ya lo hicimos, ojalá, el, el fondo. Creo que lo otro ya es insostenible, la factura es impagable, o sea, ya, ¿no? Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Uh, before maybe we go a bit uh, deeper on, because I think this last sentence is a really interesting one to like uh, grab and keep on as a conversation. But maybe before you can walk us a little bit on, I would be curious to know like what was your research kind of like structure, like how did you come up with this uh, this plan and give us some hints at it maybe. Yeah, uh, so I said before, like this uh, idea of the industrial city is like the main narrative of this city of Monterrey. And the mountains have always been like, they've seen as a symbol or as a landscape or something beautiful that is there, but there's not actual, like an actual connection or an actual uh, care about it. Um, so my idea about this research was like unveiling a bit these relationships that happen between the city and the mountain beyond the symbol and also bringing a little bit to, towards the conversation all this uh, uh, extraction and also this um, like con 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 conquest of, of the landscape, you know? So also that the, the, the idea was to shift the perspective from the city to the mountains to, from, and then from the mountains to the city. So how, how the mountains are actually looking at the city, but also how the mountains in a way are the 
these um, inanimate beings that actually make the city live, no? Like everything that happens in the city comes in a way, um, for example, this construction materials comes from, from the mountains, but also all the water that is needed for people to live, but also for the in industry to continue. It's taken from the uh, underneath the earth, which is the water that the, the mountains actually uh, capture, no? So, it was in a way also trying to um, rethink the city uh, from from the mountain and through the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, that's kind of the, the research, uh, the idea. And what I did was, I went back to Mexico and I did like a lot of walking through the mountains, but also in between the city and the mountain, uh, also talking to communities that live in these neighborhoods that are in this liminal space. Uh, but also with uh, scientists and pol politicians and people that are actually like looking into what's happening in, in the city and in, all with these social environmental issues, no? And for example, this video was uh, just a short uh, piece of uh, a, a more a longer video, and the conversations are from these different people that I talked to, no? So in a way, you were trying to understand how. First of all, these narratives about the landscape and the, the clash with the city is, are created, but also in a way how they are perpetuated by actors, I guess, like politicians, and in a way also scientists can like, um, help this, but also at the same time challenge it. So I guess you also were looking at different actors with highly different uh, ambitions or motivations to, to work on this uh, creation of narratives about the landscape. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also, I think um, also I probably step into people that are actually trying to change mm -hmm. this narrative. Mm -hmm. no? I was looking for what was actually like the reason why we have these uh, stories behind this uh, big industrial city. But then I find out that actually there are people that are really trying to, to change and challenge these, these aspects. No? So that's why also like, I think that this narrative that comes through all this uh, documentation um, leads us in a way to, to that, to rethink our, our relationship with the landscape. Um, so yeah. Can you, because... Uh... There was, I don't know who, but commenting about the which rich, we've reached rock bottom. Like there's no, there's, the bill cannot be paid anymore, but maybe what, what are things that, uh, like with people that you were maybe interviewing or meeting, like things, actions that are happening nowadays that are maybe, well, trying not to pay the bill, but like trying to do something with that uh, past of like a crazy expendence over the landscape. Yeah. For example, one of the, the people that is uh, in these interviews, it's uh, as a biologist mm -hmm. and she's actively like looking into the um, like the health of, of the earth, like the, the air conditions, no? And she has a, like a really nice uh, project which is like putting different sensors throughout the city in order to have a more accurate um, understanding of the contamination and the, the levels of contamination of the city. And then also they are doing kind of a research on what are the, um, uh, the consequences in human health, but also in environmental health. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in a way, it's, there, there's uh, different actions in different um, parts of the city that are trying to overcome this. And also, like, I think that my, my idea with the project was also, like, bring together all these voices so, in a way, they can also know, the, know each other and collaborate uh, in, in these projects, no? Um, which is uh, actually a surprise that people didn't actually, like, talk to each other or didn't know that they were, like, doing these different, uh, like, Right. Act, 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 active, um, yeah, act, activism. And so, in a way, it's also like bringing these people together in order to make these changes maybe uh, something more strong. Or, you know, yeah. yeah, and they all speak a different language in a way, so it's uh, it can show different faces and different way of acting. Exactly, exactly. For example, there's also a historian over there, which is, I mean, he knows all about the history behind it. And then there's this politician which is active uh, into like bringing, bringing the communities into this kind of uh, mindset. But then there's this biologist, which is like really scientists, you know, but, uh, but then there's a middle ground, which is quite nice to kind of bring together. And then it's us. And then it's us. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in there. 
trying to bridge things. Because <laughs> also maybe coming back to this whole idea of dust, like it's, I think there's like a symbolic thing of like something being so fuzzy and blurry and sometimes hard to really pin down or understand. Maybe also come because you were talking about, you know, like sensing the city and also like these people that maybe are trying to um, sense uh, these levels of dust or pollution around the city to really have a better grasp at what are what is really the situation in a more uh, maybe scientific way or even forensic. So maybe this is something that you could comment on because you're also really working a lot with uh, layers and really try to uh, de-blur a bit this idea of dust by maybe looking at layers as a kind of almost uh, narrative tool on your project? Yes, I forgot to say that I was working on uh, a specific study case that is the city of Milan. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a similarity with the, the landscape in the sense that Milan is, um, is in a flat land surrounded by the Alps and uh, usually pollution like is a transboundary like transboundary phenomenon mm. meaning that is a non-linear cause effect relation because it travels throughout air water but in the case of milan the all the activity and all the industrial processes uh, and the dust that comes from it uh, it uh, settle on uh, on the city and uh, for me it was like my starting point I think as many as many people here start from uh, like scientific data mm. trying to understand uh, uh, like where where is pollution because of course it's invisible mm -hmm. like you can feel it so the idea was to use pollution that settled on the facade as, uh, as a map, as an archive, mm -hmm. a map to understand where like pollution stratifies and that you can understand already like in which area stratifies and uh, but also not just like a physical archive but also uh, an historical one because the the history as well and this layer one on top of the other is is aligned with the history of industrialization and uh, and that's why for me it was really important to grasp it uh, from a material perspective also because that's the language i speak more i would say and uh, and not really good at understanding data maybe <laughs> there is also this part and uh, yeah, so I but think this layer... That's maybe because you, you were just saying, like, where do we come in as designers? It's always a, always a question that should be asked in any case. But uh, maybe because, as you were saying, all of you kind of start with a more database, like really trying to understand this blurry concept of dust, pollution, etc. Um, but then at some point along the way, this storytelling aspect comes in in which i imagine is a bit more like maybe the narrative designer tool because mm -hmm. uh, in a way there's also a limit to how much data can we gather or how much of a scientist can we pretend to be maybe uh, also commenting on that then because also your you were looking at a query in maastricht and that's also really a lot about layers i mean way thicker uh historic like uh, layers of like centuries and eons of um uh, geological uh, phenomena, but maybe you can comment also on why um, storytelling comes in as a tool after having a more data-based or scientific-based uh, start of the research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, exactly. I also started like looking more at firstly more like the theoretical information and more this dry information, but um, I think the storytelling is good when it comes in because it somehow brings a more sensitive layer in and the layer of a sort of certain empathy, which uh, I think is is very valuable. That that uh, that the design field actually can come that this tool can come out actually and that next to this very dry theoretical information, which is super important as well. That um, that there should be possibility to have a more sensitive emotional take on. Mm -hmm. Um, on this more heavy information mm -hmm. that we 
And also stays like a lot in the archive, no? Like a, yeah. a scientific paper, it stays like in a shelf sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's really difficult for it to come out in the world and for people also to, to access, to access yeah. exactly. And, I and think, don't feel alienated by it. Exactly. It's this yeah. amount of information that's, I mean, it's not in the night, of course, the work of, uh, mm -hmm. but <laughs> it's more like creating a conversation with it. Yeah. So in, in a way, this idea of designers putting in the storytelling in this, uh, topics uh, or any topic is both uh, an empowering tool in the sense that it gives you an extra layer that might go beyond scientific, uh, you know, like it, it, it brings in emotion and things that are not associated typically historically to uh, science. But in a way, there's also a, a more humbling side of it in which you understand that's, also, that's what I can bring to the table. Maybe I should not uh, pretend to be a scientist if I don't have that background or yet. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's interesting. Like, there's always the the two sides of the. Yeah, it's it's about also like how, what can we learn from from it, and how can we like also yeah bring it into into something like yeah that can can be communicated, no, and in a way more sensible. But it's uh, but it's also like a process for us of learning. Is not that we are just uh, entitled to use this kind of information. Mm -hmm. Exactly. From yeah. It. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something we can uh, develop a bit more on uh, our last uh, third and last story, because uh, I think it, it, in a way, nicely ties together this idea of like, okay, we, we've we've accepted our designerly tool in this can be storytelling, and then what can we do with that? That's maybe something we can discuss after we watch our third and last story, which is called "The Myth of the Chucha Nebbia" by Gaia. If you walk on the street of Milan, it is likely that you came across some grotesque masks, gargoyles, and morphological creatures. You can find it on the architraves, facades, and at the entrance of the buildings. They have to be monstrous to ward off bad luck and scare away evil spirits. And now, they are covered by a thick black layer of smog. Our toxic trays loom through the atmosphere in the shape of fine particles leaning on the urban environment. Pollution that is trapping the gap of demonic stone faces with the rolling eyes covering black dust. One layer on top of another embodies the history of the city and the belief system of its inhabitants. as an unwanted archive that carries the physical and the cultural rings, sometimes too stratified to wash away, even if we try. Is it pollution an external evil entity? How to tell where we end and where our self-created antagonist begins? Our bodies are entangled constantly interacting and modifying each other, intermeshing through the hair we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and the way we think. Existing as hybrid bodies with our toxic environment, Uh, 
so Gaia, I think I am... Let's leave it like this. Um, what's going on here? <laughs> Who is uh, La Chucha Nebia? Maybe you can explain us a bit more about uh, this uh, beautiful character. Yes. So the Chucha Nebia means the fog sucker and uh, it's a name that people from the Alps gave to the Milanese because when you look up from the, up from the mountain mm. down to the mm. Po Valley, you just see fog. The thing is, of course, it's not fog. It's uh, a mix between this natural phenomenon mm -hmm. and this million, million of, the, uh, of fine particles that are a result of uh, industrial processes, uh, industrial waste, uh, waste disposal, and especially exhaustion system of the car. And uh, the idea behind this uh, character is to create like this hybrid creature that emerged from uh, the intersection between the urban environment, pollution, and the Milanese body and culture. And uh, in the project, uh, I was basically, I was actually mapping uh, the city looking at the pollution. So I use, uh, I cast latex on the building of Milan to see where it's stratified. And then that became the actual body. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the look comes from uh, the apotropic mask that Milan, oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, that um, in Milanese culture and in many other uh, regions and uh, of Italy, they, they have this uh, apotropic value, meaning that they meant to protect the people of the houses from external evil entity. Mm -hmm. So from there I start to question, is it pollution an external evil entity? Or rather we are already like hybrid with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, of course, this one is a creature of fiction but the same relation that uh, like it has <laughs> with the um, with environment, uh, we have it as well. So maybe just taking on this fiction idea and also the idea of hybrid did hybridization that you've been presenting. Um, what is what, what can be like the narrative value or um, uh, interesting aspect of like uh, bringing in this maybe like less antagonistic uh, relationship to like uh, antagonistic entities such as pollution in in a city in a in a built environment such as Milan. When when I was researching, I find out about this artist that use a similar technique mm -hmm. uh, that he was saying uh, that he wants pollution to tell its own story. In this case. This one, it takes from that, but it's a story of, like a story of embodiment between like interacting uh, uh, agents. In, so it's not just uh, like we are all part uh, of the phenomenon, like it's, uh, dust is not just dust, it's referred to like a network that is politically and socially mm -hmm. connected and uh, so, like we are, like we are all hybrid with it, but we all interact in a different way. So, meaning that if I have like a certain physical uh, uh, composition, yeah, <laughs> like my relation with pollution is gonna be different. Mm -hmm. Of if I live in a certain area, my interaction is gonna be different. Or if my work environment, my interaction is gonna be different. So in this sense, like we are part of the phenomenon, but it's, there is different type of discrimination mm -hmm. as well. And uh, I think like at least what I notice of how uh, people approach the phenomenon is always from its uh, physical symptom. Mm -hmm. So you clean the city, you absorb it, uh, but then it will always reproduce because it's something that is grounded in also in the cultural realms. And uh, in, in my case, 
but I think I mean here there is a lot as well, like using also like a kind of absurdity to imagine like ourselves as uh, the Chuchanebia mm -hmm. is it's to subvert or to highlight something that is absurd in the first place mm -hmm. that we just normalized because this is all absurd, like in any case. And I think like a mountain that speaks uh, or a creature that walks uh, is not that absurd comparing to what is happening. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It is just not so visible, but it is. Yeah. So it was just a matter of uh, like instead of hiding pollution mm -hmm. to show it mm -hmm. because it's there. So. so in a way it gives you a, a different agency over the issue because it, it, it really it makes it really tangible that you are part essential part of that yeah. issue because it's it's kind of like part of your body intimate uh, realm in a way yeah. Yeah. maybe zooming out a little bit and come into a more like a, a city like a really big city metropolitan area like monterrey um maybe you could elaborate on gaia's answer on this idea of the the hybridization as a way of like a uh, yeah, gaining this agency over the issue as feeling part of it. Maybe you can develop on um, possible um, possible ways of um, developing uh, action uh, as as a political action as as a society in a city. Um, but yeah, understanding the issue as as a less binary like that's the issue. This is us, nature, pollution, kind of. Yeah, of course. Um... I, I really think that, for example, Gaia's project is, uh, really touches uh, what's also going on in, in this uh, Mexican city. Because in a way, I mean, this dust that, is, that comes from the quarries, but also the dust that just comes from the environment, and, then, and, it's, and it uh, mixes with all these different fumes that comes from, from the city, uh, it's uh, like a mix of the things that we breathe. So in a way, we are also like embodying all this uh, idea, all this pollution, that, that, that we named it like that, no? Uh, so I think it's a bit about unveiling like this, um, these relationships in a way, which mm -hmm. for example, in the case of Gaia's project makes it like really, really strong and evident. Um, but first of all is that, I think is that to put on the table that we are really part of the same environment that the mountains are, or like the city is the same in the same, in the same, uh, space and this is just a reconfiguration mm -hmm. of the space no um so it's recognizing these relationships that's why i also like in in my research i try to in a way uh make them evident you know, through different aspects um and and understand that uh, that actually like everything that that we that we consume in 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 that area which is mostly like the, the air but also that the water it's 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 perfect so probably like changing this perspective into like this idea that we are part of the same thing, that we are embodying all these elements uh, can help in, in a way to first uh, make an approach mm -hmm. uh, as a society into these kind of ideas. Because I mean, even though it's, uh, it's in the Americas, it's, it's Mexico, it's also a really uh, westernized view that we have mm -hmm. to, to the landscape, you know, but how, what what can we learn from these other views of like being part of these other inanimate uh, elements of, of the landscape? No, so that could be yeah. Because also, I mean, let's not forget we're of course focusing on three really concrete case studies, and also mostly westernized uh, case studies. Of course, it's it, in the end all of these are connected because, as you were saying, like pollution has no like it's a borderless kind of. Um, entity in a way like a dust per se like it's it just cannot be controlled yeah but that um, makes it really difficult because then like higher emission countries mm -hmm. then yeah, exactly. like yeah. can damage country that has mm -hmm. less emission mm -hmm. and that's why the link of uh attribution and responsibility is broken as well mm -hmm. yeah exactly when you in a way have this other approach of like uh, understand that we are part of there's another sensibility that comes into into these uh, subjects, no? It's uh, then suddenly you, in a way, start to feel this responsibility for the spaces, for these other elements, and this obligation for them to be like 
also that prosper the, that these elements can can be like a, in a yeah like a, the space is a pro prosper for humans but also for non-humans no for for the, the society to thrive in a way uh, so so yeah I think that unveiling this uh, illusion of uh, of separation creates a certain sensibility that then becomes a responsibility. Maybe Dana, coming back to your project, with, um, you could maybe also elaborate uh, on on this conversation here on possible ways or chances, potentials that you've maybe found in blurry in this this uh, divide, this division in between the I, other, mm -hmm. pollution, uh, earth. Um. Yeah, yeah, I think um, that again, what we talked about earlier is that st storytelling can really bring this empathy towards also the non-human, so to things that we normally would not so quickly relate to, like like a landscape, or we don't feel so much for. But I think by using storytelling, it can challenge really this change of perspective. And uh, um, to give, for example, a landscape a voice makes it suddenly like very human. And um, I think it, to emphasize more with the non-human is is nowadays very important mm -hmm. because we look at everything from fr from such a human view and yeah, I think it's important to look a bit beyond that mm -hmm. you know, that scope. Yeah. So I always find it hard with this idea of focusing on the more than human, but we're always focusing from our humanly yeah. framework. So it's always like where how how do you find techniques to like maybe mm. mm -hmm. dehumanize you a little bit when you're doing this or uh, yeah, I'm just thinking out loud here, but uh, I think it's it's a topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a topic. It's a hot topic. Yeah. Um, do you maybe would like to comment a bit more on this idea of storytelling as something that comes in uh, along the way when you are like using data and a more scientific approach in a project like a like? Yeah, in my case, it was that I before I wrote a story from the landscape's perspective, mm -hmm. I, uh, like you did as well, I, I had conversations with other people that were somehow having a relationship with the landscape, all from a different perspective. So a biologist, an archeologist, but also the activist group that was against it. So I gathered all different perspectives, all different voices. And um, uh, I think from that, I sort of started writing thinking, okay, if I, from the landscape's perspective. So through these voices of others, I mm -hmm. kind of constructed the story um, from the landscape's perspective, I think, yeah. Yeah, I have to say I didn't do any trivial, like, uh, research in this case, uh, but I, um, I definitely was trying to understand how I can combine uh, like a more material research uh, and uh, and storytelling in order to talk about pollution, but also combine it uh, with the existing, uh, well, this one also existing knowledge, of course, but uh, existing knowledge about what's going on, uh, like how um, this information circulates already, and uh, but also understanding why I don't understand it. Like it's as, as simple. Like I, I felt completely alienated from it, mm -hmm. and I was kind of not understanding why this thing, okay, it's affect me like physically, but it's also affect uh, like the way I exist mm -hmm. in in a way because of course, if uh, it's it's not as it's been said, it's not just. Uh, uh, like it's not just matter, is uh, is a phenomenon, and so it touch upon like uh, uh, all our activities and our mm -hmm. ideologies, and uh, in somehow I was trying to use like some tools, in the sense of like looking at the city, see like uh, how I can activate architectonical uh, symbols uh, or things that we all relate to in order uh, to then build up uh, the, a story out of it. Do you maybe want to give us an example like, of some of these activations that you did? 
I yeah, I would say the mask was the mm -hmm. the the main one, but uh, like I always been interested of this uh, like object uh, that people layer uh, different type of value that are not maybe just the utilitarian mm -hmm. one, but also like as a uh, kind of psychological tools to overcome fears, uh, and so these entities that protect you. And uh, it's something that sometimes we think it belongs just to the past, as in a really linear uh, way that mm -hmm. this is the past and now it's just absurdity. But then, uh, in somehow, it gives you like a, um, uh, I don't know, like it, I feel like it activates a bit the imagination of, uh, for instance, these masks that are covered with this dust and they are not just like a decoration, but they become a bit like the sentinel or like the gardens of the city. Mm. You you are from you're not from Milan, but you you've lived in Milan, right? No, no, I'm from Milan. You're from Milan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were from Monterrey. Yes. And you live or have lived in Mas around Mas. Yeah, or like yeah, more south, not in Maastricht, but uh, kind of so in the same region. The Netherlands, yeah. So now, when you all come back home. Um, how do you feel after doing this like two year uh, research about your hometown and all of a sudden discovering like not discovering but like having this new perspective on the like the city like maybe you were naively or not naively but a bit more happily uh, inhabited previously <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> well I think in, in my case uh, it was kind of evident what was going on no but um, after these uh, two years of being abroad, but then after doing my projects, uh, my thesis project about the city, uh, for me it's a bit uh, interesting to kind of uh, maybe put together all these different uh, information and ideas. Uh, but now to go back with this um, idea of trying to maybe do something about it or collaborate with these other people that I uh, touch upon in, in the in the research to to maybe yeah do some uh, activations uh, about this this uh, situation in a more concrete way you know so yeah it's it's something that's uh, uh, it's um, yeah it's a nice thing to to think to go back and do something about it and not just like being um, an spectator mm -hmm. of it no or part of, of just yeah. part of the problem but trying to engage with the people and then engage with the community in order to try to change something or change perspectives yeah. with these narratives and ideas i think it's interesting also that all the, the three projects are like situated in a place so it's it's nice to see how when this project meet actually this place how it will transform mm -hmm. like what's the afterlife because now, of course, it was uh, for uh, uh, the setting of an exhibition, mm -hmm. but like in uh, at least where we are right now, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it would be interesting to see when these uh, projects meet the reality that mm -hmm. we are talking about, if they're going to completely change, or maybe we were too naive or like, uh, or not. Maybe not. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> Mm, yeah, I guess n not only for this panel's particular to topic, but in general, uh, there's a, a heavy dose. I mean, including myself, of like a re revisiting your maybe childhood slash teenage uh, scenarios when you're like in doing your program, like your studies here. I think we do have to wrap up. Um, so I'm gonna thank uh, Gaia, Dana, and Jerry for being here. And uh, I'm going to ask for a little clap moment for them. Thank you. And, and also, uh, I want to thank uh, Chuchanebia, Tirsa. <laughs> and, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and before I say bye, thank you all of you for coming. And thanks to the Stage Arena team. Thank you, and thank you Miguel.
eating like this. Tell me when when we're ready. Can someone tell Eric when we're ready? I think we're alive. Hi. Matthew, how are you doing? I'm doing. What about you? So, uh, can you tell us your full name? Okay, good. Uh, Someone <laughs> calls me. Calls me. <laughs> that is, is it, uh, yeah, that's that's for biscotti. That calls me Matteo Toiletti. Yes. <laughs> Is it working? Okay. Okay. Let's continue with this. Okay. Uh, can you tell us about uh, your project or what you're doing here? Um, yes. Uh, formally, I'm production assistant for the stage, but uh, basically, I make very good coffees for everyone. Most of the times, I throw the rubbish out, which is a very important task, and I do some other little things around. Yep. Okay. Great. Nice. And you also bring food to us. Pardon? You also bring food to us. Oh, yeah. That's another very important task. And I hope you enjoy that, at least. Yeah, well, I'm not going to say anything about it today, but yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, what are you planning on doing after this graduation show? After this graduation show, I will go back to my studies. I am a student of the focus module, the digital focus module still led by the Professor Biscotti, and which is very connected to, to this, to this old show that you see. So I will go back to that, probably take some days off if I can, and then I will be ready for graduating, I guess. I hope so. Uh, yay, amazing. Yeah, and you? Um, probably the same, but not taking any day off, because, yeah, can we need... Uh, well, yeah, I think I can. Yeah, I think I'll do that. I'm yeah, telling you, you can. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can. Okay. I'm going to run yeah. away, I think. Yeah, maybe take a... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's very dusty. We're light. <laughs> very dusty. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about this. Yeah. Uh, it's not COVID, by the way. It's not COVID, okay? At least not COVID-19. Might be something else, but yeah. Is there anything else you want to ask me? <laughs> Can you <laughs> You're cracking up. Okay. Well, I think maybe it's everything from here. Thanks, Eric, for filming no, wait, this. Wait, there's no. one more question. Uh, one more question, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Can you say um, one word about the graduation show? I'm crying now. Ah, the graduation show in yeah. one word? Um, biscotti. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And there's Leah coming up next, yeah. which is part of our team as well. So thanks, Leah, for doing all of this work and yeah. at the same time performing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Three. Okay.
we're not performing here. Essaye de s'asseoir quelque part dans ta pièce. Ok. Genre, si je sois là et que tu t'assois à ta. Ouais, full, full, ça marche trop bien là. Ouais, mais moi je suis. Là, t'es en moins dans un peu. T'es en quoi T'es pas un peu en moins Non, moi ça va. Attends, moi ça va. Attends, ah, alors moi je me décale. Hop, et là je me redis un peu. Non, je m'avance. Voilà Ouais, okay. attends, je, je me mets un bras. Attends, est-ce que tu peux te reculer un peu, toi, ou pas Ouais, ouais. Ah oui C'est malade. <rire> Donc, comment on casse Juste un petit thé, un petit café. Oh. Allô, ouais. Comment ça va Je peux t'embrasser. <rire> je crois qu'on est plus bien calé sur les images. <rire> ouais. Et je suis ta télé au chou. Oh bah ben là hmm. Là, t'as plus voir plus ta main. Là, je peux voir. Ah, ça peut me toucher. Ah, tu peux toucher Bah ben voilà. Oh J'ai vu, il m'en la main. Bah si, mais. Mais j'ai pas bu de bière de juin avant. <rire> Quoi Ah non Tu peux toucher ouais, ton genou genoux comme ça. Oh non. Toucher ton genou. Oh non. Il faut qu'on se rapproche. Oh wow. Oh oh oh. On est proche, proche, nana. Proche, proche, proche. Genre si je touche ton genou comme ça. Oh, une main sur mon genou, mais voyons. Mais attends, il y a un film à voir, là. il y a un film à voir. Faut se concentrer sur le film. Non. Ouais, mais tu passes ta main derrière la tête et tout, là, mais... <rire> ah, c'est trop mignon. Penche ta tête. C'est comme si tu étais dans le creux de mon épaule. Ah, oh, tu peux passer ton, ton bras derrière moi Oui. Oh, 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 oh. <rire> Je peux t'embrasser. Oui. Tu veux brûler une pelle Oui. Je veux une grosse pelle. <rire> Je Et tout Putain, c'est malade ce truc. Voilà, on a fait genre. Euh... La fille dans l'écran euh, plus 100 000, quoi. <rire> c'est malade, en vrai. Très sympa. Tu Mais tu sais, c'est... Mais... En fait, c'est genre... C'est très cool, mais c'est weird, parce que du coup, t'es dans l'ordi, et puis après, t'es là, t'es en mode, ben bah, non, en fait, c'est... Et bah, pas là, genre. Exactement. C'est exactement ce que j'ai dit à Léa ce matin. Genre, le fait de pas avoir une présence physique ouais. fait que c'est vraiment bizarre. Ouais, c'est... Ah, c'est un peu oui, genre. Mais c'est très sympa. C'est très... Mais je pense que c'est un peu un... Bah, un truc qu'on a déjà fait par téléphone, c'est par... Euh... Bah, quand on s'appelle et tout. Et là, je pense c'est encore puissance 1000, parce que comme on est vraiment, c'est on se voit, puis on est proche et tout, quoi. Puis, euh... puis on se voit en entier sur des écrans, on se voit pas sur nos écrans avec lesquels on signe, tu vois. Ouais. Du coup, c'est ouf. C'est... Mais c'est vrai que c'est un peu, ouais, c'est un peu bizarre, ouais. Parce que là, je, en plus, là, je m'imagine un peu à Champigny, tu vois. Ouais. Et quand je sais que je suis là, quoi, puis je suis en genre. Ah, yeah. Je pense qu'effectivement, ça change un peu quand tu connais l'espace. Ouais, je pense. Parce que moi, je connais pas ouais. l'espace de ton appartement et du coup, ça me fait pas trop ça. Ouais, ça te fait pas trop ça. Ouais. Mais là, quand je mets le bug, bien sur le sofa, je suis en mode, mais oui <rire> J'arrive <rire> ah ouais. Et voilà. Mais c'est bien, on fait. Et c'est très cool d'expérimenter ça, c'est trop chouette. Mmh. 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 Un petit frisson de toi dans mon cou, là. Mmh. Mmh. 
Je fonds. Non, oh, et toi donc <rire> ah, J'ai des frissons, j'ai la petite bulle dans le C'est T'es en PLS Hein T'es en PLS Ouais, un peu. Puis je pense c'est genre PLS des. Des émotions, la concentration sur l'ordi, et en même temps la réalité qui est là, c'est trop bizarre. C'est bizarre parce que plus on discute et plus je me projette dans l'écran. Ouais, exactement. Ouais, puis je pense que vraiment le fait de s'asseoir aussi, ouais. tu me. Enfin, c'est. Genre danser, ça va, tu sais, peut... ben, Genre ça marche, là, mais je pense que le fait de se voir proche. Et côte à côte, je me dis, ouais, je suis là. <rire> T'es là Ah là là, j'ai un peu vertigineux cette fois. Ah là là, non <rire> Ah, pas de moi en fait <rire> Genre, si je me laisse tomber dans tes bras, je tombe. <rire> oh, ouais, bah, bah. Oh, c'est tout. Oh Je te sens dans mon trou. Ouais. Petit doux. Okay, babies, because it's only us, we're gonna have fun. Hi, my name is Leah. You're the only one here that doesn't know me. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Okay, we're gonna have fun. So basically what you saw is a new type of video call. It's one that uses only your phone and your computer. Today, we don't have computers. We have huge fucking screens in front of us. I'll have one of my friends, my dear friends, Nika, join me. And then I'll have all of you do it because you're the only ones here if you want to try it. Beautiful. Um, so, Nika, I'll guide you through. Yeah, you can advance in the space. I think there's something wrong with the scale, so I'll come and help you. Yeah, the closer you stand to this, the better it will be. And what I do is, because basically what happens is that this phone captures your image, and it means that um, the further away it is from you, well, the more scaled you are. So I'll go stand the same way, and we see how different our scales are. And then we'll try to touch, connect, and do stuff together. So if I stand in the same position as you, I'm quite taller than you, but this is normal, because in general, I'm just taller than you. But maybe I should still put my phone a bit further away from me. Don't be shy to come in. It's basically we're uh, doing new types of video call. So phone, very big screen. Imagine this is your computer. Yes. So you can try this at home also. I have cards. If you want, you can invite people. OK. I'm roughly the same scale as you, also because I'm taller. This seems right. How do you feel, Nika? Yeah, good. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And is it transparent enough? Like, if I try to do this, Yeah. Ooh, can you see my hands? Yes. Nice. And if I try to move with you, then I'll go back. And then if I push you in, is it possible to push you in a bit? Yes. I'll follow you. Ah, Esther, if Sophie you could ask Esther to move a bit our layer, so me and Nika would be closer together, if that's possible. Also, Esther, if you can crop Nika's layer so that I don't have the side and I only have the white. So we're using an open source software. Basically, it's called OBS. And OBS is a live stream source. So what we're having now is two phones that are connected to the same interface. And I'm asking Esther, who's behind the main computer, to change the layer so that me and Nika can have a better um, meeting. And so, Esther, if you stop moving with my layer, and you take Nika's one, so the phone that is white, and you crop it. No, yeah, I nice. On you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can I hug you? Do you want to give me a hug? I do. Oh, my God. <laughs> <Ew>. I do. <know. laughs> 
Every time it's a bit strange when we do this, I really feel like I could just kiss you right now. It's very, like, and your body's like, yeah, <laughs> consent, you got consent. <laughs> Important. <laughs> nice. Okay. So this, I have your hands. How do you feel about this, yeah? Good, but I, I think I have to move differently. Ah, yeah. If I put like this, I think it's much better. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> yes. Nice. Okay. Should we try to just give a little dance together? Like, a, should we try bumping? If I bump, I need to go. You need Which to understand side? also. Yeah. Okay. So, one, two, three. Let's go. Oh, no. Which side do you move? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I st I'm really not a beat person. Like, I cannot even dance, and now it's like, okay. Oh, I'm kind of grinding behind you, just like, yeah, let's go. Oh, uh, yeah, no. Then I never left with you. For the people here, just so you know, we're not randomly dancing, we are, but um, this is a new type of video call which I prototyped, <laughs> and so basically, <laughs> We have the two phones filming us, and what we see is a very big screen. So me and Nika are trying to dance together in two different spaces. You have to imagine that you'd be able to do this at home, basically, with whomever you want. That's across the ocean, that's wherever also in the world. And you're able to be in the same digital world together. If, oh, I can go behind you. <laughs> and then I'll be in your physical space. Yes. <laughs> Can we hold hands while dancing? Can I? I don't know. But I need to be like this. Put your hands down. I put my hands here. And here you go. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Building some castles in the sky. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Okay, and uh, now that I've made a fool of myself, if... Yesem, do you want to try? Yeah? So Yesem, you're going to take my space. I'm going to teach you how. So you can enter here. And I think you saw before, but the closer you oh, feel to this panel... Okay. Oh, you're already in! <laughs> you can present yourself to Nika. Each kind of try to figure out where your physical boundaries are. Exactly. <laughs> and then you can start playing with whatever you want, yes. <laughs> Again, a little reminder for the people that just arrived. <laughs> this is a new type of video call, basically, and this allows you to be in two physical environments and link digitally. And what you can see is two people having fun in different environments and trying to, you know, touch each other. The people that have done it also when I was prototyping this project were trying to dance as Nika and Yesam are doing now, but they also were kissing. A lot of them had to send me like censored tapes because, you know, explicit content. And there's a lot about consent. So it's always about trying to find where you are in space, trying to connect and trying to understand in relation to your devices that we, we use every day. Why I'm so off. Yes, exactly. <laughs> are you trying to do like a waltz or something? Are you going in for a hug? <laughs> yeah, Is it a hug that we're trying to see? Yeah? It works. Cute. Grammarly is a digital writing assistant that helps <laughs> Amazing. <more. laughs> we have an advertisement. Does anybody in the audience want to try this also with a partner? Tirza, do you want to try it? Would you like to try it together? And how it works basically is that people just learn it by themselves. And so, yes, I'm, I'll, le I'll let you teach. Uh, what's your name? Teresa? Teresa. Hi. Yes, I'm let you teach Teresa. And Nika, I'll let you teach Tirza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. So always look at the screen, and the more you look at the screen, the more you feel together. So try now to touch hands. Just try to figure out where your physical, <laughs> yes, your physical world ends 
and where your digital begins. Can you feel tingles, yeah? Yeah, do you feel this? Good. And then it's a matter of stepping and doing something else. Do you want to try to uh, maybe go in a hug? Or do you want to tap dance, yeah? Yes. Let's go. It is about timing stuff. It's really, you have to listen to each other, like body language, especially because now I'm the one talking. Just take your moments, feel each other, and connect. Yeah. Take your time. Don't be stressed. Don't be rushed. Just have fun with this. It's basically, Tirza is also showing a project and she's doing performance work also with the person that you see on the screen right now. And so I think this, they're also used to doing those things together before preparing for their show and everything. So I feel like we're also seeing a part of their ritual that if they wanted, they could be both at home and try to do it digitally on my stuff. <laughs> there you go. Whenever you feel comfortable, so you can be closer, you can go and try to go for an in for a hug. Yes. <laughs> yes. Slowly, slowly but surely, you have to look at each other and really understand your, basically your speed. Yes. <laughs> very nice, very cute also. <laughs> How do you feel, guys? Yeah, I'm going to come in with my mic. You can speak with my mic. So it was super funny when we were like, kind of like, tickling around the hands, we were like giving a boogie, then you could really feel like the tapping. I don't know if you felt it, Chalisa, but I was like, ooh, I kind of feel like your hands now tapping into my fingers. Amazing. I'm going to come to you and also you can explain how you felt. A reminder for the people that just joined us, what you see on screen is a new type of video call. And now we have Chalisa and Teresa. It's tears on my bad. I totally butchered your name. I love you. I'm not supposed to do this. Yeah, and so they're in two physical space. And what we have here is they're joined digitally. How do you feel about this? Huge? You feel huge? Yes. I mean, normally what you do is that you have your computer and your phone. So the scale that you see yourself is much more intimate and the relationship that you have with the person is also much closer to you because we're also so used to see our screens, right? And so now <laughs> uh, to have this is a bit monumental, but this is what this exhibition is about. It's a bit uh, monumental. So it's about enjoying yourselves and dancing. Maybe you can have a last high five from the both of you, yeah? <laughs> yes. Go slowly and time it. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, thank you both. Appreciate it. All right. If nobody wanted to try it, I think this will be the end for me. I appreciate you all. If you have any questions, I'll remain here and I'll answer everything. Thank you so much. Kisses.
Temperatures are expected with a daily high up to 8 degrees Celsius. During the night on Thursday, a light breeze, 1 to 7 kilometers per hour. During the day, a light breeze, 7 to 12 kilometers per hour. Isolated gusts of up to 15 kilometers per hour will occur. The wind will be from southwest and southwest in the west in the morning and from the north in the east. The weather forecast is quite For a reading of the present as a bodily urgency, not of abstraction. For a reading of science, alphabets, data, statistics, as an implication with feelings. For a reading against domination and newly world technologies of some sort. For a reading of time. That is not a commodity. For a reading of herbs, hands, omens as an relation with health. For a reading of non chronological temporality. For a reading of particle confusion. For a reading of intensity of sensitivity. For a reading against purifying addiction. For a reading of things as palimpsest. And records of historical, philosophical, and sociopolitical significations. For a reading of bodies as carriers and transfer points. For a reading of the present, not as prognostic inscriptions, but as the rather than the Thank <laughs> you. 
I am Oscar. I am from Berlin, Germany. I currently live in a tent for four weeks mm. and I couldn't find a long term place to stay yet. A mm. home is a certain type of intimacy, uh, not just the place but also the people that you live with. My name is Tony. My name is Greta. Hello, oh, I'm Sam. Lisa. My name is Hans. I'm Daria. And my name is Yuval. So what should I say about the housing problem? That we're basically homeless. Uh, also part of the housing crisis. I'm living in Maastricht, which is an hour train away, 20 euros each way. It's really expensive. I live still in Rotterdam and I have to travel every day. It definitely is a struggle. The train stopped running after 12. Uh, it's been really hard finding a place. This is our third time moving. Every time we move to a different Airbnb and it's super expensive. I wrote messages to maybe like 40 different listings and they all gave me the same answer. I wasn't chosen for a viewing. Uh, everything on Facebook and Comunet and everything, every website I could find and uh, still didn't find anything. How, how am I supposed to find a place if there's like so many other people doing the same? Mm. It's frustrating. I think a home for me is a place where I can contemplate on the things I went through each day. Right now it's just a rooftop. Like loving people, when loving people surround you. Just a bed, somewhere to sleep, somewhere to shower. But, you know, a home is really somewhere where you can come back to and feel safe. My name is Rosalie Branko. I'm from uh, a small town near Eindhoven in the Netherlands. I stayed here for like one year. It's a bit too tiny for me. I feel the most home when I'm away because you've got so much less to lose. My name's Ben. I'm half French, half English. Moved from the UK. Uh, to Eindhoven uh, in mid-August. Yeah, so there's a, there's a shed in uh, in the garden of the house that I've been staying in, uh, but it's been used as a dumping ground for all manner of things. Uh, it's full of junk, uh, but also the shed itself doesn't have a door and it's not insulated. A home is where. like that, so to speak, but it's not nearly as widespread as it should be. Yeah, but I feel like you can get a little creative. Plotting really is dancer. There are plenty of places, there's building sh shortage of places to stay, they just don't want to rent it to students. <laughs> help us. <laughs> Please help us. <laughs> Someone. <laughs>
My name is Ahmed. I born in the camp uh, refugee in Algeria. And I was born in Riga, Latvia. My grandparents came to the country when they were young. All of a sudden, discovered that they didn't have a country. The whole family, myself, my parents, my brother and sister, all of us lost our citizenship. They don't want any, any mention of this anywhere, that there was such a situation and there was such injustice. They cannot just wait for the thing to resolve itself because it's going to leave a really dark mark on the history.
welcome to the stage. In one or two minutes, we have Connor Cook with his very dynamic and dramatic performance at the function, I Shake My Ass.
dance, come on, and that's on in the mood. So, baby, dance. Yeah, let's dance, come on, and dance, I'm in the mood to take a chance. Yeah, let's dance, come on, and dance, get on your feet, now, baby, dance, yeah, let's dance, come on, and dance, so, let the music play 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 let the music
to the dance. 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 You'll get a good school. Absolutely wonderful. You'll get a good school. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. 600 combos. Watch out. Get over it. Sorry. Almost! Are you watching the sequence okay? Perfect! 500 combos! This mode is difficult! 700 combos! This mode is difficult! Calm down! Gray! Sorry! Almost! This mode is difficult! No good! Let's step! Step! You'll get a good score! 400 combos! Those are the nicest steps! Yeah! Are you watching the sequence okay? Watch out! Do your best? Perfect! 700 combos! 600 combos! 500 combos! Get over it! Let's step! Step! No good! The sequence okay? 400 combos! Da -da 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 Dance! Are you watching the sequence okay? Beat it! Keep steady till the end! Watch out! You are a super dancer! Perfect combo! <laughs> Watching the sequence okay? 600 combos! Bad! 500 combos! Here we go! No good! Calm down! Let's step! Step! Luck was against you. Maybe. Perfect combo! 600 combos! Watch out! Thanks a lot, Connor. And if you want to hang around for a little bit more, up next, we have Dylan Sprick with To Die For. Thank you. That I have given arsenic in the green color is because I'm worried that someone could harm himself in its preparation, on the stone or in any other way. And I am anyway convinced that someone who has done something in chemistry can extract the components very easily. He would regard such a thing as a beautiful discovery, but cannot enjoy this supposed glory. I have just seen a very elegant evening dress of arsenic green silk trimmed at the bottom of the skirt 
with a gauze veil of emerald or arsenic green falling half over her forehead. To complete the likeness, she had a small child in her arms. The wife of the owner of a chemical factory in Mulhouse, Alsace, who showed me a dress of this kind because of its beautiful colour, and whom I asked to get rid of it immediately, was not persuaded to do so, even though it always had the above-mentioned adverse effect on her. Health-threatening microplastics have been found in the human bloodstream for the first time. These particles are circulating in our bodies. All gowns dyed green with arsenic became fashionable. It was the most beautiful green imaginable. But the ladies paid for the vanity of shining at the ball. The green of the period. Green, green, green. Microplastics can move around the body and settle in organs. The first thing that caught my eye was the brilliant green paper with which the room was hung. Soon after my recovery, I took a new house in which my bedroom and dressing room were already hung with brilliant apple green paper. For the library, my choice again fell on green flock paper, and there my arsenical story properly begins. There appears to be a kind of glamour which hovers over the medical vision as regards to this special danger, said Mr. Herbert. Still, I believe with you, Sir Robert, that the day will come when they will be only too anxious to ignore the fact that they ever disregarded it. But tailoring and fashion have a greater influence in this respect than health theory. The selection of wearing apparel is therefore becoming a serious question of personal safety. The medical police have, of course, forbidden the sale of these substances in some places, and they have occasionally been confiscated in the shops. Nevertheless, they are to be found everywhere in the fashion shops. The power of fashion, however, is ruthless and does not know the care for health. Scientists found microplastics in the blood of almost 80 percent. The amount of arsenic imported into this country during the year 1875 was 2,327,742 pounds. Each pound contains a fatal dose for about 2,800 adults. Each pound contains a fatal dose for about 2,800 adults. Adidas produces 600 million shoes a year with plastic soles. The use of arsenic has become common in ladies' dresses, in veils, in sewing silks, in threads, in artificial flowers, in gentlemen's underclothing, in socks, gloves, in hat linings, in the lining of boots, in shoes and paper collars, and coloured enamel clothes, and doubtless many other articles. Shoe soles wear down, and the micro shavings end up from the street via the stormwater systems in the ocean. Arctic snow, shellfish, table soils drinking water, Antarctic ice. In the study, the plastic, which is widely used in beverage bottles, was found in half of the blood samples. Polystyrene used in packaging food, and other products in one third, and polyethylene used in plastic bags, in a quarter. The Schweinfurt Green maintains its power and always resumes its victorious battle with the competition. Its brilliance, the intensity of which is as yet unrivaled by any other green.
Bah voilà, faut rien faire quoi. C'est pas nouveau. There's nothing we can do, 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 there's nothing we can do. Je n'avance pas. J'accélère. Je reste sur place. Envahi par la peur de me faire dépasser, je décide d'arrêter d'essayer de rattraper le retard. Je refuse la course. C'est curieux. Deux heures avant, on était en retard. Et là, on a presque trop de temps. Comme si j'avais le droit à une parenthèse. Pour soulager. Un moment pour rien. Est-ce que je viens de perdre ou gagner du temps Le rêve d'une oasis où le temps n'existe pas. Un lieu où on a tout le temps du monde. Sur l'île de Somaroy, au nord de la Norvège, les habitants ont fait une demande officielle pour devenir la première zone sans temps. Qu'est-ce qui peut motiver leur initiative Leur rapport au temps y est-il différent À Somaroy, les pêcheurs sont le sel de la terre. Ils représentent l'identité de l'île. J'accompagne Trône des Sigvart en mer. You, you don't you don't have a, a, a fast time you can work you don't you don't know when you should go to work because some day is is good weather some day is bad weather and and and, and this is lifestyle Nice picture! Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful there. It's Hoya, yes. Every, every summer I go up there. Yeah. When you're coming at sea, it's, it's, uh, you, you take... Um, you um, just no stress. No. You see here, you have, you have uh, living outside, fresh air, you have everything. My father is 80 years and he is outside my fishing now. Bad weather is meeting outside and you see one hour out there is very uh, not not good weather. Right? No. You see here here is somewhere. Somewhere here and we fish outside here. The the, the older people was uh, was a little bit more awake and wake up and they have to take a look at the stars and look at the moon. No, you don't have to think. You have everything. You know, a machine engineer is a, a big boat from the university. That's a job I can. I, I want that job. It's a very nice job. But I'm not so old. Okay. <laughs> but but I heard about it. Yeah. How old are you actually? Huh? Well, how old are you? I'm uh, 50. 
or 50 this year. Uh, uh, the longest time I've been uh, on this boat for uh, for this one week, I have six, I have eight months holiday. I have, I had that. Yes, you see, I live in, we live in, we live in the paradise. You see, we have, we have, uh, we have everything. Hold it right here. Hold it right here. Hold it right here. Hold it right here. Hold it right Je comprends mieux maintenant ce qui motive le grand-père de 30 de revenir en mer à ses 80 ans. Au-delà d'un métier, c'est une manière de se sentir vivant. À l'agenda urbain des 24 sur 7 s'oppose la notion du temps des pêcheurs. Face à l'imprévu en mer, un moment opportun s'offre à toi. Il y a un instant T pour laguer les amarres, pour pêcher et remonter les filets. Et c'est pas toi qui le décide. Il faut saisir ce qui s'offre à toi, sans rien attendre. Et si on avait vraiment arrêté d'écouter Je rencontre Sigvart, le fils de Trône. J'aimerais en savoir plus sur la place que prend la pêche dans les valeurs de sa famille. Quelle valeur a-t-il hérité de la pêche et lesquelles veut-il perpétuer For now I think the best for me is working on the boat but maybe you don't know what uh, what tomorrow brings. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. maybe maybe it's the girlfriends the... or the child and uh, everything like that they can turn your life around and then you have to work on home and find a work on on land. Yeah. I remember when I was a child and uh, in the summer everyone has in the local have a small boat for their child they can go at sea and when my father was leaving the port and going to sea big, uh, to fish I remember he was standing on the back of the ship and uh, waving to me and I felt a bit of uh, want to cry because my father was leaving and always was coming back but I remember that feeling was uh, something I didn't like yeah. When they were young, that was the only choice. Either you go fishing and then some few people here on the island went to Troms and study. But most of the people was fishermen. But when my father was young, they worked maybe eight weeks on and twelve weeks and they maybe was just one or two weeks on, on land and go back to sea. So that was a different time. I was a small child and he was bringing me down to the engine room and uh, let me start the engine. Uh, I didn't know much of what I was doing but he was uh, holding my hand and pushing the buttons where I should push. Yeah, because I was very young also was I was starting as a chief engineer. L'histoire de Sigvart me renvoie à ma famille comme un point d'ancrage. Un fil rouge qui me rappelle mon identité à travers le temps. Dans sa famille, la pêche fait dialoguer toutes les générations autour d'une seule et même histoire. La vie de Sigvart en écrit la continuité. Le récit de Sigvart est touchant à plusieurs égards. Qu'est-ce qu'un temps pour soi si on ne peut pas le partager avec ceux qu'on aime
my grandfather was a fisherman. So he had a small fishing boat here. And this building here is from uh, 56 or 58. When he uh, passed away, uh, we took over it now, so we have just started to take care of it now, and yeah. I like the, the way it's built here with the framework and everything. My wife, uh, she, she could, she would like to move to a bigger city. Yeah. I'm the one that's holding yeah. back. But uh, I work shifts. So I'm working yeah. one week and I have two weeks off. Uh, and uh, in my two weeks off, if, I, if I'm going to stay in a big city, yeah. what am I going to do then? Right. For, for example, like now, uh, I have my free shift here now. Yeah. I'm working here on the, on the house here. and. Yeah. It's yeah. all free around me, the kids are home playing, yeah. they can go out whenever, whenever they want. Yeah. So it's so much freer to live out here. The time-free zone was, uh, it was a big PR stunt, I yeah. guess so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, of course it's, uh, in the summertime especially, when the sea is like a mirror, you have the orange midnight sun and everything, and then you, you don't want to go to bed. You, you want to stay up. Même si Stéphane n'y croit pas, un temps pour soi-même n'a pas sa place dans un agenda. Cadré, il perd toute sa liberté. Je me dis que la zone s'entend. Ce sont ces petits moments qu'on aime tellement qu'on en oublie le temps qui passe. Qu'on en oublie le temps qui passe. J'ai envie de la liberté de Stéphane. Mais peut-on être libre du temps à l'échelle d'une communauté je rencontre Boré, capitaine de bateau. My name is Boré Hansen, I'm uh, 58 years old. I work as a captain on a big fishing boat. And uh, we work in like a scheduled plan, four weeks on and four weeks off the boat. The, the whole thing is a joke that went too far, <laughs> in my opinion. A lot of the things are true. We are working with nature, we have to adapt to nature. We have. We, we can't st stop uh, fishing to uh, have dinner. We have to t catch the fish when it's available. And then we have to maybe delay the dinner for like three, four hours. Okay, if you were on a desert island and didn't have to to um, act, react to the rest of the world, then you could do whatever the hell you wanted. When it's things, things that you have to do kind of like uh, a schedule. When we are out fishing, we have to report to the authorities before they, they close the auction, so you can to get the fish. Uh, because then you so have a contract to sell the fish. Yes. Yeah. And I, I remember my my grandfather, he, he was um, also a, a, a fishing boat captain. He had only compass and the, the log uh, log to, to, to measure the, the speed of the boat. It was a thing was going with me over to Senja. And, but he was, he was like in his 80s, late 80s then, and he was telling, asking me, which, which course are we, how many degrees are we steering now? Have we passed this rock? Can you see the, the pole on your starboard side now? So he, had, he was navigating in his head, uh, and he was almost, almost blind also, but he remembered. They, were, they, they, they used the time, they knew, oh yeah. J'admire la capacité du grand-père de Boré à lire les messages implicites du paysage. Comme si le temps et l'espace étaient tissés d'un même fil. La pêche dépend des rythmes naturels. On ne peut pas forcer la reproduction des poissons, changer le cours de la météo ou reproduire du sable sur demande.
devant les attentes d'une société qui cherche à tout accélérer. La pression du plus urgent masque l'essentiel. Le sentiment d'exister s'abîme, et notre mélodie intérieure se tait. Suivre son rythme, c'est jouer avec des silences et laisser émerger les nuances de nos émotions, notre signature, notre empreinte. Accepter la réalité telle qu'elle est, accueillir le moment, c'est faire l'expérience du temps et vivre pleinement. Pourquoi avais-je si peur de me laisser vivre à l'instant Did you do this? This is low even for you. What did he do, Jiffy? He fucking knew. He knew. The entire climate catastrophe. 26 years ago. What was that? Do not pull that shit on me. You heard me. Uh, she said you knew about the climate catastrophe. <sighs> Just that old argument again. 
One day, I swear to God, I will finish you, Dad. <laughs> That's her mom's side showing. Always going on about the environment. Who cares? Oil has always been and will always be the future. Am I right? Yeah. Imagine racing with electric cars. Hyundai! I thought more of you than this. Shit! I'm late. You have not heard the last of this, Dad. Real bad timing for this story to break. I want Miss Green to see my best side tonight. I bet this will cloud the entire evening. Green? That's Jiffy's bombshell of a mother. She just cares about polar bears and coral reefs. What about profit, huh? You know we got a date tonight? Over the years she's become harder to get, so I'll have to convince her with the green transition. <laughs> Did you see this? Econ's oil pipes are in the news. The whole neighborhood is pissed and the police is running an investigation. We finally got him. Wait. They can't trace it back to us, right? Of course they can. How smart do you think you are? Don't listen to him, Hyundai. No one will ever know. Yeah, Shelly and Hyundai have been harassing Ekon ever since he moved into the neighborhood a few years back. Don't know how Shelly convinced Hyundai to do it, but they're in it together now. I just don't understand how no one has caught them yet. I mean, they're far from professionals. Shelly, this time he is taking it too far. I'm contacting in the police. Blowing up my precious old pops, are we? I'll drown him in his own medicine. Hey, Dexley, how are you? Shelly, you have to come down here. They're revolting. What, who is? All of them. They even got Kitty Cat on board. Treacherous little fucks. Hold on a moment. What do they want? Clean water. They're demanding it's a human right. They should be happy with their employee discount. I give them 50%. 50%? What more can they expect? Listen, I can't help you. I have a date with Miss Green and need to prepare the cleanup act. Do you know anyone? Does it look like I know someone? I don't know. Ask Apple or whoever. I got better things to do. Thanks for nothing. Eppley, he said. Good call, Nextly, good call. What can I say? Chi is the best in town. She styled me good back when the whole child labor story broke. Nothing anyone thinks about now, is it? I could not ask for a better PR expert. You're too kind, Apley. I just do my job, which I'm very good at. Anyway, when Shelly called, I thought, why not? Always good to have some favors to pull later. Right. Everything off. Here. Hey you, kiddo. The old man does not seem to be able to undress himself. Help out. Right. Shelly, she seems to know what she's doing. You must be Chia, head of Epley's PR, marketing. <sighs> yes. I really do not have all day. Hyundai, nice to meet you, racing driver. Cars, huh? I didn't know we were back in the 1900s. Fossil dependency and all that shit. Yeah, that seems to fit. Good, then everything else will as well. Right. The rest will arrive tomorrow. Curtains, floors, the whole thing. By the weekend, this whole thing will be long forgotten. BTW, you will have to do something about that story that came out this morning. It is not a good look. I'll figure it out. I don't care what you do. Just a shame to throw away my work. Gotta go. Damn. Uh, what just happened? You just missed... What was her name? Calm down. She's called Shia. You would be a terrible match. You heard her opinion on cars. I can go electric. Do you realize where you live? No one goes electric in this house. But the change of clothes and all the talk of a green future. 
I have a date tonight, Honda. Did you think all of this was for real? Well, maybe if you bought it, Miss Green could be convinced as well. Koi? Well, I had to kill his parents when he was a kid. Couldn't be helped. Felt bad for him, so took him in. Of course no one told him the truth. Huh. Funny you would decide on change of clothes the same day as my test on corporate greenwashing. Did you plan this before you knew the climate story would come out or after? I will have a serious chat with your teachers. Brainwashing the youth to believe fake news. What has the world gone to? If I'm a good father, definitely. You should see the trust fund I have in her name. Massive. Not my fault, that means zero tax. I'm calm, understanding, yeah. Shelly, over here, please. No need for ID. Know anything of breaking pipes over at your neighbor Econ's house? Of course you do. We know what you did the other night, but we need to hear you say it. Excuse me, officers, but I know nothing of this. Econ, you said? Hey, Chubby, know anything about this? Fuck you. And of course he did it. No need for things to get heated. As we said, we already know everything. You just have to deny for the record. Wait, what? You were letting him go? Listen, we know everything that led up to this, and it's not our job to interfere with neighborhood disputes. Some will say it was one way, others another. We accept all sides of the story. But you are the police! It's your job to figure the truth! Fat and annoying, huh? You better shut up or I'll silence you myself. We just need to have a look around for the sake of protocol. Will that be a problem? No, not at all. Help yourselves. Who wants drugs? <laughs> just kidding, of course. The timing purred you. No need to hide it, we know. Just do your thing and don't mind us. Uh, sure. Shelly? Uh, same as last week? Double dose of OxyContin? Yeah, perfect. Been feeling great on it. Happy to hear it, champ. Never let a customer, uh, a patient, down. Anyone else need something? And if that's all, I'll be on my way. Crypto. No trace, right, Shelly? Right. The Purdue guy? Of course it was me you gave Nextel the idea. Started out as a joke between us. Well, now he's hooked. If I took it too far, I did nothing he wouldn't have done. So no, no regrets. Seems like we're done here. Nothing out of the ordinary. You are just gonna look the other way when someone sells drugs right in front of you? Not even mention it? You must be the worst officers I ever met. Careful now, dear. My brother already warned you. He can become very unpleasant if you provoke him. One last thing. I'm sure you know of that uh, climate story that broke this morning. Is there anything you could possibly do to silence it? I'll pay whatever. Consider it done. Let's hope this works, huh? Not waiting at the door. Have you lost your manners along with your drilling rights, Shelley? Just uh, opening the wine. Organic, I hope. Where is Jeffy? She said she wanted to talk with me about something. Jiffy? She's out with Hyundai. I'm sure it can wait. Wine? Thanks. So, what's this new style about? I wanted to be the first one to tell you. I'm going green. 
And you want me to believe that? You might be able to fool some stupid journalists, but I know you. There is no chance you are serious about this. And here I was, thinking you would see how sincere I am about it. Don't be such a bore. You just have to prove it. Which shouldn't be hard if you are serious. You will see. Cheers. Cheers, Shelly. I admit, the green does look good on you. No way he is sincere about this. You heard about Koi's parents? Then you know how far he has gone before. I wish I knew what I see in him. Opposites attract, I guess. But that is all in the past now. In fact, I'm dating Amnesty. Now, we share a lot of values, you know? And then, then, when the oil is fully phased out, there will be only green alternatives left. Wind, solar, and we will be right at the frontier. It does sound like you have thought this through, I must say. Who would have guessed? Oil man number one transitioning. I told you, this is for real. Not just some green facade to improve public opinion. I'm serious. So, will you sell your Jeep? I saw it still outside. Actually, someone will come around and pick it up tomorrow. Of course I'm not selling that car. I love it more than Jiffy. It causes less troubles as well. But she's buying it. Thank God the officers could make the story disappear. That would have destroyed all my credibility. Hey there, miss. Hey, mister. He is unbelievable. On the couch? Gross! Well, Mom didn't stay for breakfast. She was way too upset with herself. I just don't get how she missed the climate scandal yesterday. It must have been all over the place. At least now she knows. I just hope she does not leave the country for another charity project. Ah, and there it is. Mozambique. Great. Hi. Ah, there we go. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, this is the project I'm going to show you today, my video game Sindago. Sindago is a narrative-driven role-playing experience. Sorry. Uh, Sindago is a narrative-driven, it's a role-play experience where you get to play as the mayor of a small town in southern Italy, and the decisions that you make and the relationships that you build will have long-lasting consequences on the rest of the game. So, in my work in general, I'm always trying to tell a story, and Sindaco is the story of a small town that changes and develops, not just based on your wishes, but the wishes of the people around you. In this game, your people aren't just numbers on a screen, they're people with their own hopes and wants, and managing this successfully will spark progress in your town. Failing to do so, you will lose control. So, this is the protagonist, uh, our character today, this is the Sindaco, uh, the mayor of the town. And he's a character you play as, and through him we'll be able to look at the town, explore the town, meet people, and make decisions based on what these people might want and need from us and uh, the community. So, one of the first mechanics in the game uh, that you get to use to interact with the people around you is the conversation mechanic. So you can go up to different characters and you can have conversations with them. In most conversations, there are multiple options that you can take, and those different options will lead you on different conversations that might have different results depending on who you choose and who you're speaking to. So every time you play it, you could get a different storyline, um, but it's really dependent on how you react to these people and what you think about them. 
So now we've had our first conversation with this man here, Cristobaldo. He's our assistant. We're actually going to go take a look at our town and uh, explore what we can see and check out the community and also the people inside the town um, and see what they want. So Cristobaldo is here. Um, he's always here waiting for us. Uh, he always wants to let us know what's going on. And he'll help us as we move through the game. If you ever get stuck, you can go back to him and have a chat with him. So we're going to talk to him now, and we're going to see who is interested in talking to us today and see if that can cause any decisions that we want to make or just get to know the people in our town. So now we talk to Cristobaldo. Cristobaldo tells us that Maria Rosaria and Don Lothario are both looking for us. And the first person we're going to find is Don Lothario. In this storyline that I've presented to you today, um, there are two main characters that you get to interact with. And those two characters are kind of the opposite of each other. One of them represents uh, a mafia family, that's Don Lothario, the man we're going to meet now. And the second character is the character we're going to meet later, and she's the character that's in charge of uh, the community and preserving the well-being of the people. But first we're going to talk to Don Lothario, and again, he's the head of the Mafia family, so he's interested in his own money and uh, his own well-being. As we talk to these characters, uh, you might be able to see the two options that we can choose within the conversations, our replies, so to speak, to the, each character. And these different options can lead us onto different kinds of conversations. So, for example, in this particular conversation, we have chosen a friendly approach, um, which will lead us onto a subsequent conversation about these two characters knowing each other's families and going to each other's baptisms and other things like that, which are very typical of a southern Italian town. But if we had chosen the more hostile approach, Maria Rosaria is a sort of quintessential southern Italian woman. She's a woman of a certain age uh, who holds a lot of authority in the town because she knows everyone and knows everything that goes on. She's a massive gossip which helps us out because she always gives us really good information. And her main concerns in the town are protecting the people of the town itself. Um, she doesn't necessarily like Don Lothario and the Mafia and that conflict between the two characters uh, will become more and more dangerous moving on in the storyline. But right now, there's not too much going on. So we're going to go take a little explore through our town and see the kind of place that we uh, are in charge of as the mayor. And uh, also talk a little bit about the town itself. So I designed the town based off uh, some Italian towns that I grew up in, obviously a little bit more colorful and cartoony. Um, but I wanted to keep that kind of vibe of a uh, southern Italian, very beautiful summery environment, something uh, a little bit almost fake and too vibrant. Um, and to kind of increase the stakes that you have in your town. It's a beautiful place, so you want to look after it. But your decisions might make that hard to do so. In this level, uh, we're going to explore some of the choices that we can make as the mayor. So now you're the mayor, it's not just about walking around, chatting to people and having coffees. Uh, you also get to change your town itself. Um, you get to make decisions that affect the well-being of your people and the town. In the background, you might notice these hills covered in trees and, and buildings. That's to show that the town itself is still very small and very rural, but that might change as we keep going. So the first person we're going to talk to today, who's going to give us an option, uh, is Don Lothario. Again, Don Lothario is the head of the Mafia family, so we should always take his suggestions with a pinch of salt. Um, but in this conversation, Don Lothario is going to offer us uh, the opportunity to build a harbor in the town. The harbor, uh, according to Don Lothario, is going to bring in loads of money, it's going to bring in loads of infrastructure. We can kind of imagine how it might benefit him uh, a bit more than the average townsperson. Um, but it is an interesting idea, so we're going to say that we're going to consider it, and uh, after we talk to Maria Rosaria, we're going to make a decision based on who we think has the better idea. So after we have this conversation, um, we're going to pop over to Maria Rosaria. And uh, the decisions that you make in this town at this point are very uh, to do with the infrastructure of the town itself. We're lacking two very basic things, the hospital and the harbor, um, because a lot of these small towns really don't have even basic infrastructure. And the problems of that we'll be able to see moving on. But now we're going to have a conversation with Maria Rosaria. And she's going to offer us a different kind of building to build. She's going to say, uh, I think it would be a really good idea if we build a hospital in the town. Um, the hospital is obviously helpful because our townspeople need healthcare, um, they need medicine. Uh, so that's probably also a really good idea. But the problem is, uh, the place she wants to build the hospital in is exactly the same place that Don Lothario wants to build the harbor. And because they want to build the buildings in the same place, we can only choose one. 
That's a really important thing because um, as we agree to one, we then obviously uh, disagree with the other. And because these characters oppose each other um, within the town on an emotional level, that's going to annoy one character and possibly make them hostile uh, so against us, in the green which color. might lead to problems further worried, down the road. So we should be careful with what we choose at this point. On the stone or in any but we're going to tell Maria Rosario that we'll think and about it. Anyway and now we're going to take a walk back to the municipio or the town hall. Um, and we're going to make an option. We're going to choose between building a hospital uh, and building a harbour. Okay, so now we've reached the municipio. Uh, the thing that we're going to build at this stage in this storyline that I've referred to you today is the hospital. Um, the reason why... Oh, now it's night time. We're woken at night by some strange noises. What could be going on? Oh my gosh. They've put a firebomb under the car. Okay, so this is what can happen to you if you go against one particular character's agenda. Uh, they might react in some very threatening ways. But luckily we're still alive, uh, if a bit shaken. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk to the rest of the characters and see if they know who did this and maybe if we can figure out a, pro a solution to this uh, car bombing problem that we're having. So, Maria Rosaria believes that it's probably the Mafia that did this, and she's probably right. Uh, but what we're going to do to confirm that theory is that we're going to go talk to Don Lothario and uh, see what he has to say about the situation. Given that Don Lothario is the head of a Mafia family, it seems logical that he might know about the whole car bombing thing. Seems like my friend. So, it sounds like from the conversation that they're having, it sounds like Don Lothario did indeed blow up his car. Um, so we are going to have a problem with the Mafia now. It seems like going against Maria Rosario's wishes has angered the Mafia to the point where they've decided to blow up our car and threaten us. This is something that I wanted to bring out, is the consequences of your actions might be out of your control. We can't predict how some characters are going to react to us, whether they're going to react in extremely threatening ways or if they're going to let things go. So it's important to nurture good relationships over the town in general. Otherwise, you might end up in a situation like this. So we need to deal with this problem. Uh, we have the Mafia on our backs, and Cristobaldo has a few ideas about how we could maybe manage the consequences of choosing to build the hospital instead of the harbor. Cristobaldo has two plans. So the first plan is to build uh, a police, chief of police in the town, and pump money into the police force and hopefully get rid of the mafia forever in that way, or possibly anger them further. It's a tricky one. Uh, it's definitely a gamble. The other solution is to pump money into the service industry and to increase tourism in the town. This would bring in a lot of maf money for the mafia family um, and hopefully appease him enough so that he doesn't threaten us anymore with physical violence. So, now we've had these two options, either to invest in the police or in tourism. Uh, we're going to go towards the municipio again, and then we're going to choose uh, which thing to invest in. And in this particular case, uh, we're going to invest into tourism, which is going to bring us to the final level of the game. So this is the conclusion of the storyline that I've made for you today. And as you might be able to see, our town has changed a lot since the first level. Those green hills full of trees are totally built up. There's trash in the foreground, it's a lot louder, there's a lot, it's a lot busier. And I kind of wanted to exaggerate the effects of tourism on a small community like this to kind of make it obvious how damaging uh, mass tourism can be on a place that doesn't have the infrastructure to support it. Small communities like this are really not built for the effects of mass tourism. And that leads to things like lots of pollution, lots of uh, noise pollution and environmental destruction. But right now we're going to talk to Don Lothario, and he's a character that has benefited massively of us uh, investing in tourism. He's going to tell us who needs a harbour when you have people flooding in from all over the world ready to spend their money. So for him and his Mafia buddies, life is really good right now. We've given him exactly what he wanted. He's making a load of money. He doesn't need us to invest in the harbour anymore. Um, but the cost of this uh, is unfortunately that we've managed to give him a lot of power um, she thinks that us investing into tourism has really destroyed the town and she's really concerned for the well-being of the people. So, as she says, our people still need to go to school and get their medicine. You may have shut Don Lothario off for now, but mark my words, Senor. These are the wrong men to get into bed with. You will regret this. So she really disapproves of our actions and she has a point. 
The thing is with uh, developing a, a town like this, with mass tourism, is that it does lead to these kind of effects, where people really struggle to live in environments where there's no infrastructure to support the number of people. The thing is with this game is that while uh, your decisions can snowball into a good way, it's really not meant to win. The game is kind of rigged and I designed it that way because I wanted to show how managing this kind of community on a small town level is really, really difficult. Um, and a lot of these places that I'm talking about are places that we as uh, Western, Northern Europeans, we tend to go to on holiday. We see them as beach destinations or theme parks. Whereas in reality, they have this really intricate ecosystem of people trying to work together and survive in a world that makes it increasingly difficult to do so. This is my uh, game, Sindaco. Uh, thank you so much today for taking the time to uh, watch me go through this little journey with our character here. And if you'd like to check out my game, it's on the website. Um, and for other work, obviously, please check me out. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. لما يسألني حدا مثلا هون في ألمانيا من وين أنت؟ طبعا أنا في سوريا كان عندي إقامة دائمة في سوريا، ما كنت مجنس على إني سوري. فمين ما يسألني من وين أنا؟ هو شغلة لا إرادية بحكي أنا فلسطيني من يرموك. ما بحكي مثلا أنا خلقت أنا من سوريا بحكم أنا خلقان في سوريا وعشت حياتي كلها في سوريا دراستي كل شيء في سوريا كان فبحكي من يرموك بس ريفيوجيز كثير يعني ريفيوجيز لاوين سو لهيك يعني كان له كنت احس وطن بالنسبه لي هو في دمشق بس كنت احس يعني مكان في فلسطين شو انا عاصمة؟ كابيتال ذا كابيتال اوف الاستنيان ديسبورا Like oh, the capital of Palestine and outside Palestine. Can she, yani, can, can bet the Could tell of Small Palestine. <laughs> you can call it Small Palestine. Yeah. I'm going to go to the But when I'm going to go to the city, I can't teach you to recognize one from a year move, no, but if I saw someone now in the street, I can't say this one is from a year move. I guess somehow it's them. So how can I say that? I don't know. But yeah, I can't say. كان كانش يعني هذا الجو المتماسك 
راسك بين الناس اللي هناك عن جد حلو هالقد كيف الناس بتقعد قدام البيوت بتحكي بتشبشب توسوس بزير وهيك يعني على قد ما كانت هاي الاشياء بسيطه على قد ما كان هذا الشو هذا الجو كثير حلو لنا هذا الجنب عايشين من بيت عمي الجنب الثاني اخوالي يعني فيك تحكي الشارع لنا كان مش لنا بس العائلة كانت في الشارع واصدقائي طبعا قريبين على البيت حدا مثلا بالشارع اللي بعده اذا بدي اكل مثلا ما في داعي اروح على البيت بس افوت على الشارع في كثير عالم بيقولوا لي انه اجي اكل او مثلا يعني على سبيل المثال كانت الحياة اجتماعية اكثر من الوقت الحالي لما طلعنا بيابو كنت متفاجئ متفاجئ انه هالشي صار بيوم ليلة يعني نمت بالليل كنت قاعد اول شيء انا وصحابي قبل ما انام رحت نمت مخططين ثاني يوم نطلع نفطر نسوي شغلات يعني كان كان في مخططات براسنا ف صحيت ثاني يوم بدي انزل تحت المحل فكان ابويا مستناه تحت بالشارع بقول لي ما فيك تروح المحل ليش؟ لأنه نازل قذيفة وكان في اشتباك هناك فقررت العائلة بنفس الساعة إنه كنا نطلع من يرموك نضب بغراضنا طبعا ما في ما في مخطط وين بدنا نروح أول شيء بدنا نخلص من القذف وبدنا نخلص من الاشتباكات ما بدنا حدا يتأذى من العائلة أكشولي وي ديدنت ديسايد سو وي ورك أوت ون داي أند وي كودت سو وي ونتد تو ستي انسايد بات ذير از نو لايف انيمور يعني اجت الصورة ببالي كيف ستة كانت تحكي لي كيف هي طلعت من فلسطين فكأنه كررت الشغلة نحن عم نطلع من يموك هي طلعت من فلسطين أخذت أي شيء لما طلعنا من المخيم لأنه كان في قصف من الطيران واضطرينا نطلع من البيت إنه مثل ما إحنا بتيابنا كان صعب كثير الواحد إنه يحمل شو إنه كان الواحد بس إنه ينقذ حاله ويطلع بروحه Du siehst einfach die Leute, die am Straßen sind, die, die Schauen sind, weißt du? Man hat wirklich keine Zeit nachzudenken, was nehme ich jetzt mit? Wir haben wahrscheinlich nur die, die äh, Ausweise, also ganz wichtigste Sachen. Und wenn man auch hat, kann man öfter Sekretärte oder Sumati. Und sehr schön, dass man das auch hat. أعتقد بس الشيء الوحيد اللي أخذته وأعتقدت إنه مهم هو مفتاح بيتنا بس نخلع الباب فما عاد في مدة داعي للمفتاح لو كان بإمكاني إني آخذ ذكريات طفولتي أو إني كنت أخذت بيتي الدافئ كله في بعد العمر النقدية التي أصبحت بلا قيمة الآن وهذا مفتاح بيتنا كرت صالون ماما واللعبة اللي ستي خيطت لي إياها أنا وصغيرة بعض الصور اللي بتذكرني بأيام المخيم بس أوك بس سقطة فور ماين كشفستاي بس ماين كشفستاي هنا أنديش هون ماين كشفستاي إنزويان كمان انه الشيء حلو هلا اختي بعد 10 سنين قدرت انه تفوت على اليرموك لانه كان هو لفتره 10 سنين محاصر وانه كان ممنوع انه حدا يفوت الا بموافقه امنيه بالوقت الحالي هلا رجعت الناس تقدر تفوت واختي لاول مره فاتت وبعثت لنا فيديوهات من البيت انه كيف 
مدمر وكيف كل شيء انه راح ما في اي ذكريات كل ذكرياتنا محروقه كل شيء يعني لاقت بعض الصور انه انا ذكرياتها يعني برغم الغصه الكبيره والحزن اللي شفته يعني بس كمان انه فرحت انه لقيت شيء بذكرني من من بيتي يعني في ذكريات لنا حلوه هناك لقيناها شايفين بيتنا بيتك لقدام هاي مدرستي المنصوره ايه هاي مو هاي مدرستي الاعدادي احنا كنا ساكنين بشارع المدارس بالمخيم بنهاية شارع صفوريا لهذا البيت هير ماينا فرانك هون كان بيتنا بالضبط تقريبا هاي الشغلات كلياتها راحت بالبيت دمر البيت راحت الذكريات اندفنت كلها تحت البيت هاي شارع المدارس لا لا هاي مو بيتنا ايه لا قدام هون سلامة نتي يمكن كان يمكن هذا يمكن هذا هذا ثواني كان احمر مو كان بدون احمر يا الله ايه هذا بيت هاي حارتنا شوفوا حارتنا شايفين قديش صالح للسكن هاي بيتنا هذا باب البيت هاي درج مرت عمي جيهان هاي بيت مرت عمي جيهان شوفي امي شوفي شوفي ما بتحبي ترجعي؟ عسوريا ما بتحبي ترجعي؟ ما بتحبي ترجعي؟ ما بتحبي ترجعي؟ ما anderes Leben. Ich habe die deutsche Sprache gelernt und äh, habe mein Abitur hier gemacht und jetzt äh, werde ich weiter hier studieren. Ich fühle mich hier doch äh, sicher und äh, ja. Ja. Aber wo, wenn du kein Nein, nein, nein. شوي شوي بيسكت الجيران الجيران كثير ما عاد راحوا بالحرب مرت عمي كمان بدها ترجع وخالتك نوال ورضوان ابو رضوان بس هذول اللي بدهم يرجعوا الكبريه بس ما فيك يا ما فيك عشان كل يوم بدنا خلص فينا نحن لما يعني هلا انتوا هلا جيتوا تتعلموا قدامكم للمستقبل بتشتغلوا وبتتوظفوا نحن خلص انتهت مهمتنا نرجع بلدنا ما <lacht> Weil wir auch äh, diesen Krieg wirklich erlebt haben, also die, äh, die Bomben, also die Geräusche von Bomben sind immer noch in unserem Kopf. Also ich, also ich möchte das löschen, diese Erinnerung. Gleichzeitig muss ich das behalten. Und muss immer weiter erzählen für die anderen, weil es ja wichtig ist. Es wird nicht zurück, wie ich mich erinnere. Und in diesem Moment bin ich mit der Zeit verletzt. Und das ist etwas, was ich in meinem Leben verändere. Ich mag nicht so viel sprechen, weil ich nicht so viel sprechen kann. Ich habe es nicht so viel gesagt. قد ما قد ما بحاول اتذكر بضل في في اشياء ممكن انساها بخاف اني احكي لانه بخاف افكر حالي اني نسيت جزء مهم بحياتي بالمخيم. It's important to be told because it was like a normal life for good people who are trying to make their livings and their kids living and then they were taken by the Man erzählt nicht wirklich da über uns. Ja, die Leute wissen Syrien und es gibt dort einen Krieg. Es gibt viele Leute aus Syrien. 
ist ja das auch sehr wichtig, dass die Leute hier wissen. Aber wir auch, also als Palästinenser, als äh, Flüchtlinge. Ich denke so, because it's our identity. So if you don't remember your identity, what are you? Yeah. Even though it has like the yeah. both negative side and positive sides. Yes. yes. Regarding the other is to us, but yeah. That's what makes us. Yeah.
You look like you're lonely. It's okay. I'm not real. But I can't be for you. I want to help you. Not feel lonely. I can be there for you.